Well, in control against our toasts debate. And oh, keep going back and forth. That'll be easy. <laughs> Picture so bad. <laughs> Dude, this picture's awesome, Jeff. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, what is up, guys? It's March 29, 2011, and this is State of the Game. See Sean there enjoying his pizza. Sean, what type of pizza did you get? Since everyone's going to one of them. Oh, God, the songs are starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mushrooms and Italian sausage with peppers. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just trying to act interested, man. All right, <clears throat> being respectful. I'm interesting. I will admit. <laughs> so it, on it, the show, it knows the hard questions to ask. Oh, oh I, that's true. That's true. I don't have a hard question for you though. Actually, what type of beer is that, Tyler? Hops are what the heck Imperial that? India oh. Ale. IPAs, man. That's all I drink. That that's all I prefer to drink. So that looks crazy, Jeff. Why is Idris sitting yep. in your lap? Well, that is MLG Raleigh? I think it was MLG Raleigh. Is that or and DC, one of those, yeah. Yeah, I leaned forward for that interview, and it enlarged me to King Kong size. Greg sat back, and he's already a small guy. So actually, when they did those interviews, this is like hardly a Photoshop. That's just about as big as I looked, and it was so ridiculous. And my legs were actually closer to the cam. <laughs> you can't see it in this The picture. worst part is that you were wearing shorts. I know. You were just like... <laughs> it was bad, man. <laughs> it was bad. It was pretty bad, funny, sure. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and just start off the night and talk about uh, GSL, since as of late it's been kind of the topic in the StarCraft II world. And we're gonna start talking about the Team League Finals, which wrapped up I think on Thursday of last week or Friday of last week. But Tyler, I know you watched the games. I'm not sure if Sean or Jeff have watched every single game. But uh, what were your thoughts, Tyler? God, can we get uh, a little reminder on how it went down? <laughs> Serious? I watched. No, I, I watched it. I just uh, basically MMA is a badass. I remember that he got three kills at towards. Okay, the end. you're ringing oh, some bells. Yeah, that's here. right. Yep. And uh, trying to think what else happened. I Alicia know. almost. Oh, we're talking about that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alicia. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. That, that, went, like, I was. He wins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was really surprised that, like, Alicia just managed to do a very normal warp gate push against Nesty and win. That was, like, yeah. a huge what-the-heck moment yeah. in that series. Trying but, I mean... I just remember MMA was a complete badass towards the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, was, he was behind against MVP and, like, bossed his way back into the game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, Alicia, he's the one that stood out for me until that PvP, right, against... Yeah. Young Hua, is that right? And yeah, Young, he, yeah. The I was like, okay, you're, you're playing okay, you're playing okay, going to Blink Soccer, okay, now poke up the ramp, see what's up there, <laughs> see that you're going to die if you blink up, and then blink up. Dude, Just, you know, <laughs> like, I, I will admit that, like, blinking into a battle is, like, one of the riskiest things ever. Like, it worked, like, the first couple of times and people are, like, still doing it. For me, blink is, like, a runaway spell. Or yes. a, I want to kill that Colossus spell. It's so great lately. People keep blinking up the ramp when I three gate robo, and I've got like, <laughs> six, like six zealots up there and an immortal. And the zealots are trash against blink stalkers unless you blink on top of them, and then they're pretty yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the zealots are pretty good when a stalker's cuddling you. Yeah. All right, I think I found the the team league. Yoda played against Alicia. That wasn't that exciting. Ryung is another player who kind of made a name for himself th- throughout the team league as a TBT guy. Yeah, he looked pretty good too. Um. And then uh, d- men played, but I don't think he did that well. I just remember MMA coming in and destroying MVP, and that was like the big thing that everyone was gushing about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was obviously a good team league finals. Go check those out. Mm. Now, I do want to discuss the fact that we're about to spoiler something that if you haven't watched it yet, please go watch the World Championship Winter Leagues that wrapped up last night. Simply because you, know- you owe it to yourself. I, I did want to add a little bit, though, that, like, I'm really happy that Slayers as a team won because there's not yeah. that many, like, 
they're not the most noteworthy team out there. Right. But it reminds me a lot of kind of how the team league operated in um, Brood War, that there were, you know, all the individual league players who were amazing, but then there was, like, Han Ditsoff that, like, in the early 2000 era was just the sickest team in pro leagues ever. They just demolished all the best of the best, and it was so cool. Um, so I'm really hoping that we start to see that where, like, the personalities of the team develop because that's one thing that's always nice about a team league match is that, you know, in Brood War, Bisu a lot of times would not be in the individual leagues. They'd be like, all right, we're just, but you're still going to get to see him play because it's in a pro league. And that turned out just so great. I also forgot that Sella, I think, did an outstanding job as a coach. Yes, yeah, Sella Wera. Yeah, uh, him and Boxer were the masterminds. I still want to know what was on those <laughs> piece of papers that they kept slipping the players. If it was cheat codes or what, but... <laughs> Uh, he did a really good job, and GSL World Championship <coughs> Winners League happened last night. If you don't want it spoiled, just we're going to go pretty in depth on this. It went the entire 15 games. They had day one. Uh, it went all the way up to uh, Nada vs TT1, and any pro took out Moro. Sin taking out uh, any pro Marine King. San taking out Sin. TT1 taking out San and Nada. And we'll start from there. Uh, Tyler, what were what were your thoughts on day one of the uh, Winners League? Well, TT1 was quite a hero for me. I was like, <laughs> I from what I heard is, well, I guess what Artosa said is like, TT1's like, hey, I got this. You know, put me in there. Uh, I can win this PvP. And did they did they get to pick the map, or what was the deal with that? I don't know that? how the was map it was decided. Just it scrap just Station was next. Yeah, so like on Scrap, like obviously in PvP... Since it's a wide ramp, you can't just get one sentry and then be like <coughs> safe against yeah. four gates. So you kind of have to really four gate it out, get a lot of zealot stalker, and there's no way around that. And then I just love TT1's confidence. Like I know how to play this. I'm gonna beat San, and then he goes and does it. But San, he kind of seemed kind of weak. He San made some mistakes in that game, and I'm still waiting to see San be as brilliant in PvP as he is in the other matchups. So, TT1, my hero, and he was sick apparently. Yeah, he got yeah. he went People to the didn't. hospital apparently. Yeah, yeah, he went to the hospital. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know what he had. He he's been uh, posting on there's a blog on Team Liquid I think that he created or that someone created and they've been posting updates about what's going on with him. So. Uh, I haven't actually checked that out, but I assume he's all right. Uh, he doesn't play tonight in the round of six, round of sixteen. I think he plays tomorrow night. So, Jeff, you've been quiet. What did you think of day one, man? Did you watch any of the matches? I did. It was just super exciting. I mean, Team Fanatic. Uh, I'm yeah, kind of a Sen. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a Sen fanboy these days. Like, I feel like he's playing the best foreigner Zerg, if you can call him that. Um, right now, he, he just plays fantastically well in all aspects of, of Zerg. He still does uh, uh, Roach openings, which are really silly against Terran, in my opinion, but um, really? what do I know? Because he, he crushes every Terran he faces, so apparently that's superior. But played really, really well, and then uh, TT1 closing it out. I mean, not a... And, and what I kind of get irritated by, too, to throw in the drama, obviously, I mean, for day one, is, like, these foreigners do so damn good, and then half the, the chat is, well, there's no money in the line. Koreans don't really care. They're just dicking around. <laughs> like, yeah. if, if anyone's played Brood War at all, they know that Koreans do not want to lose to non-Koreans. They do not want to lose. It's like the biggest shame in the world to them. I don't care if money's on the line or, or what have you. So it just irritates me because I think it cheapens true victories like TT1 sitting across from MFing Nada and beating him for day one's yeah. final match. You know, like, that's amazing. And, and and damn the people that take that away from him. Yeah, I will say San versus Sen. I would, I don't think San was completely serious with that carrier build. <laughs> that was kind of weird, yeah. But, like, TT1's wins, even against San, like... San just messed up. TT1 outplayed him on scrap, and then TT1 versus Nada. Like I didn't see that game. What do you have, do you happen to remember? Kind of what happened Nada, specifically. Well, TT1 did this really cool build where you kind of expand quickly. The, the map was crossfire, by the way. Um, he expanded kind of quickly, and then he gets a forge up and starts an armor upgrade, and then puts a cannon in each mineral line for a banshee defense. And uh, 
Nada was going one base Banshee with Cloak, and then he like set up his Banshee like right outside a range of the cannon, and was just killing probes. And then uh, TT1 came with his like Stalker and Sentry and killed it because the cannon you know vision range, the detection range is longer than its uh, shooting <laughs> range. range yeah. So like yeah, and TT1 yeah, was Nada adding on more them. gates like right when the Cloak Banshee appeared. Yeah. It was so great. He just added on more cannons and then just kept getting more gateways. So, like, when the huge all-in came, he had so many units. It was so yeah. sick. He played it really, really well. Nada really didn't have a choice but to do, like, an all-in. T21 just just uh, played pretty solid. He didn't crumble under the pressure or anything, despite being sick, too. And uh, it was despite very Despite almost catching heroic. himself on fire as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, those, those flame things that GSL have, I've always said that <laughs> someone's going to run into them. TT1 almost did. Uh, yeah. Almost lit himself on fire. Sean, do you have any thoughts about uh, the day one of the Winners League? Um, definitely that Fnatic should be really, really pleased with its players. And we didn't get a chance to talk about Fna- or Sen's sick counterattack against Marine King with the Zerglings. Where like it was looking kind of uh, kind of a crazy position in the game where Marine King had like this huge Marine Marauder force and just um, crushed through the gold, and then it was like a twenty Zergling counterattack that happened so fast, and Marine King just tried to attack with his SCBs and lost like thirty of them very very quickly, and then Sen immediately had the upper hand. It was one of those moments where it's kind of like yeah, why don't people just like counterattack more? Does it was Marine really, really solid. Does Marine King seem like one of the most emotional players when it comes to the Koreans? Whenever he loses, oh, yeah. he seems like so, so down about it. Um, Very upset, yeah. And I, and I noticed the other day, he kind of, in an interview, he jokingly said, uh, if there's a second place, uh, it's mine or something like that. Um, so I guess he kind of joke around, or jokes around about it, but mm-hmm. every time he loses, he's always he's always got his head in his hands, and he's really, really upset at himself for losing. Uh, and I think he's like one of the only Koreans to really show that. Um, so, day two happened last night, and we started off MC TT1. But uh, you know what? I, for white for all, MC is probably the biggest match I think to happen last night. But there were so many. Um, Tyler, I, d- I disagree with that <laughs> statement, but I will hold really? my tongue for now. Okay. Well, I thought it was one of the mo- the most exciting ones. Tyler, what are your thoughts on uh, the, the opening two PVPs? Well, the first one with TT1, I mean, I don't know what TT1 was doing. I was like, dude, <laughs> you're going to die to Forgate. Like, and especially on that map on Crevasse, like, the pylon placement is so like good for offensive Forgate because you put that one pylon down, and it's on the high ground, and it's really hard to snipe. <clears throat> and then like TT1, it was, he was just doomed. At, I'm not sure what he was thinking. Um, so MC got an easy win there. Then we had the game, White Raw versus MC on Shakuris. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say, everyone's going to hate me for this. This was, even though it was probably the most exciting PvP I've watched in yeah. a long time, maybe sure. the most exciting PvP ever in StarCraft II for me, not the highest level of play. From MC. Mistakes on both sides. On both, oh, sides. On both sides. Well, okay. it's true. I'll say that White Raw played, he executed his build well, but it was risky. <laughs> And people are going to hate me for this, or maybe they'll just hate PvP for this, or they'll just hate Blizzard for this, or hate the they'll entire. They'll probably just hate you, to be honest. They're, they're just, just going to hate me. It's the easier answer. Yeah. Like, it was it was risky play. Like, I just I just watched over the VOD before we started this, and um, looking very specifically at what he scouted, he scouted um, MC putting a Chrono Boost on a gateway and building a pylon. Those two things are not optimal for an offensive foregate, but other than those two things, he didn't scout any other information saying, I'm not going to die to a foregate. And then he proceeded to go one gate robot. Yeah. Well, and wasn't he, he, well, he didn't see uh, he didn't see MC get his second gas. He did see him get the earlier second pylon, and, and uh, pretty much they did the exact same opening. They saw the exact same information... And what happened was um, White Raw went for a Robo and MC went for four gates, which were pretty much useless. They were just a safety thing. He was not using them for offensive power at all, and he was never going to use them all at the same time until he expanded. 
So it was just a safety thing that put him behind, and then he went for Blink Stalker against an Immortal <laughs> opening, and that put him behind. And uh, even White Rob building the Warp Prism, when I first watched the game, I thought that he started it after his Observer scouted the um, Twilight Council. But in fact, that was not the case. Like, um, MC could have had like a Colossus building for all uh, White Raw knew, and he was building a Warp Prism. And that's just not good. Like, he was just blindly... He started at War Prism before he saw the Twilight Council. That's all he had seen was Four Gates, which really doesn't tell him anything. So it was very, like, I think White Rod just decided MC is going to go Blink Stalker. I'm going to do a counter Blink Stalker build, which, it, and it was very brilliant the way he did it. I can't take anything away from that. The War Prism play was awesome. Yeah, it was, was pretty awesome much the see. best way to take apart what MC was doing, but it was, it was risky. That's just the bottom line. It was a weird choice, because uh, MC is, like, world famous for his 4 gate. Like, absolutely mm-hmm. world famous for his 4 gate. Mm-hmm. And all info led to world famous 4 gator this is the 4 gate opening, I'm going to guess Blink Stalkers. So, it worked out, but uh, I agree 100%. It was, it was very strange, the decision. Tyler and Jeff, would you guys both say that White Rod just got lucky in that game? or No. No, no, no. no, I, no. I think he made a read. Like, he okay. made a prediction, but it was outside the game. It was not in game information. Like, it was probably math based, and perhaps that he just got done four gating TT1. Right. The one um, thing that was most revealing for me was when he threw down the observer right when he, like, rushed his robotics facility. Yeah. yeah. That seemed like a very, like, strong indicator of exactly what Jeff's talking about. Yeah. I really like the Warp Prism uh, offensive play. Like, the dropping of the mineral line, that's classic. Everybody does that uh, when they get the Warp Prism out, which is inherently risky, too, because it's important robo-build time, and 200 minerals is not cheap in the PvP. But it was well executed there, but I really liked avoiding the force fields and actually speeding mm-hmm. up. Like, uh, when when MC ran away, in order to get around that, um, that like, ramp blockage faster, he picked him up and dropped him really fast. I thought that was super... Yeah. Super awesome. It was smooth. But then he did miss that one force field on the ramp. I would like to when say White Raw had like yeah, yeah White Raw had like really good control for almost the whole match, but if he had landed that force field it would have been a lot more one sided game. Sean, do you have any thoughts on or any more thoughts on MC White Raw? Um I'm I'm like really curious to see if there is some way that White Raw could have done what he did with more in game knowledge because Clearly, it was a brilliant response. Um, again, I'm thinking a lot about that one observer because I'm sure, as both the two other Protoss players in this podcast will attest, if you're feeling nervous in a Protoss versus Protoss and you make an immortal and it turned out that there was no scary threat coming, you're like behind in a lot of ways in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. Like, especially if you're trying to do something like a Colossus build and you're just threw away 100 gas and all this build time and no one ever talks about how expensive mortals are on minerals and PvP because there's so much of a focus on the gas and the Colossus but it really fucks a lot up when you get that immortal just for defensive purposes so then when he like suddenly gets this, uh, rushes for the robo and clearly the only way he would be able to stay alive against a heavy 4 gate is an immortal and then he gets a observer just based on seeing two, ze- or two stalkers and a zelda at a watchtower I'm really trying to drill deep to see if there's maybe some way that he could um, have just had that read. Because it was really nice to see the Protoss vs. Protoss peel out of the usual. Like, well, I was one probe ahead, and that's the biggest advantage you ever get in a PvP. But instead it was, you know, like War Prisms, excuse me, and other junk going on. Artosis was saying before the game that he had, that White Raw had told him that he was going to three-gate Robo. If he would have done that, do you think the game would have come different? worked out differently? I, I know that's kind of a lot of, of guessing, but Tyler, what do you think? Well, I'd, just to, first to follow up on what Sean was saying, I was going to say um, it was not like... This This is the amount of in, in-game information that he had. With the standard really fast, ultra-fast offensive 4 warp gate build, you're at like 24 out of 26 supply. you got a stalker building that... Uh, 26 out of 26 supply is going to be for your second stalker. So, like, at 24 supply, when the stalker's, like, 90% done, you add three gates, 
you start another stalker, your next pylon is offensive. Both players had added that next pylon to get up to 34 supply before um, adding any more gates. And they were both building probes at that point instead of yeah. saving that supply for a second stalker. So they were both indicating not the hardcore four warp gate. And then when MC threw a chrono boost on his gateway, that's again not indicating it because you need every single chrono boost on your on your um, warp gate tech. <coughs> but this is and this is why like it's so tricky because you can induce you can make someone think that you're not doing four warp gate and then just four warp gate and see how <laughs> greedy they are and call them on their greediness. So like. When uh, he po when White Rock poked with the one Zealot and two Stalkers, I was like, man, you could be getting four Warp Gated, and then yeah. you'd lose the exact same way TT1 just lost by having your stuff cut off, because a, pil a proxy pylon easily could have been at the top left. Yep. And and I'm just like, times. Uh, yeah, I was like, okay, I, I can see White Raw that you're taking a little bit of a risk with the one gate robo build. Do you really need to poke? Because that poke says to me, hey, I'm for work gating. I think that's what White Raw is saying to MC when he does that poke. Because if you're not for work gating and you do that poke, that's just ridiculously risky. And uh, so I don't know. That's all. That's the only read w White Raw had was that earlier pylon, not the most hardcore four gate, but still possible to four gate. And it's, I don't think there's a way to make that safe. You just make the decision, hey, I'm going to play this PvP risky. When you're playing against MC that's not a bad decision to make. You might want to just do something risky. Do it as intelligently as possible and with all the, the brilliant planning and execution that White Raw had, but you got to do something risky. I don't think there's really any hope for that build in the immediate future to make it based on in-game information. Do you want to... Oh. Go ahead, Jeff. You can speak. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> so, I'm so... Like, I listen to Tyler speak and I've consider myself like a Protoss guru. I know a lot about this game, but it's a privilege to hear him talk about PvP because there's so many little tidbits that I pick up each time oh, that I'm like, oh, you. wow. That that actually makes total sense, but I'm I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, read, I read the chat, you guys. I'm such an idiot. There's so oh, many people oh. that are like, what is he now? Why uh, <laughs> I just got done beating someone? It's like, listen to what he says. Just listen to it, please. Yeah. And you know what? If you think it's wrong, then then discuss the content. He's a pro. He's won championships. He knows what he's talking about. Let's just listen, please. Well, I'm going to make everyone hate Tyler some more. Uh, after that game, they brought in July. July went on to beat White Raw, Huck, Moonglade, and Jinro. And Tyler, I want to get your thoughts and, and everyone else's thoughts on the... Uh, well, on, on all those games, but more specifically the Huck and Jinro game. Because uh, I did not think they were going to be as one-sided as they were going into them. So well, I'd like to it. jump in and oh, say that shot. White, Rot, White Rot should not have lost the Scratch Station game. Damn it, damn it, damn it. He should not have lost that. I did not watch that game. That was right when yeah, I... Yeah, yeah, it was really was bad. It was so upsetting. Tell us I about mean, it. Really, like, one Void Ray, like, okay, so it's uh, a Zergling Bailing bus. White Rot barely holds and has a Stargate out. The Stargate kind of has to sit idly for a little while. I don't know about, I don't know about barely, though. See, he held it pretty strongly. He'd yeah, yeah, he did, but, you know, it's a fucking story, you know. It's just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> barely holds, right? They're really Not close. Um, it was intense at the time, because there's the sort of post-match watching, you know, like, mm, yeah, let's see what went wrong here. But then, like, when I watched live last night... I, I tried to actually sleep through the whole thing, but I couldn't because they were playing D and D so loudly out in the suite. They were role playing at the top of their lungs, so I ended up getting up to watch the match and immediately adrenaline through the roof as he barely holds off a Zergling Baneling bust. And then um, he has the Stargate that's sort of sitting idly. So right as um, July Zerg ends up kind of stopping with the bust, a Void Ray pops out and July Zerg starts an expansion. And at this point, I see no reason why he should have added a second Void Ray. Like, Phoenixes seem, like, very clearly the correct play to do. Like, because one of the big reasons why um, early expanders in Protoss vs. Zerg get the Stargate at the time that they do, like, pretty quickly after the core, is that when Zerg takes a third, there's almost no way to have Creep adjoining it. So it's very difficult to have the anti-air there to defend. The only thing you can have there to defend is generally a queen that has to 
slowly march your giant ass all the way over there. So you get one Phoenix and lift her up in the air. So, like, Void Ray straight into Phoenix, I think, was, like, the clear choice after he's held off a bus, because there's almost certainly not an expansion up for Zerg. And if there is, he's going to have to rely only on Queen. So, like, I think White Rock could have done that while doing some sort of even regular old expand. Um, and would have yeah. been fine. He went for the bus against five queens, pure lane. It, it was pretty... <laughs> and there were roaches there, too. Yeah, yeah, it was... A million transfusions. <laughs> like, it's like, this is going to be a mess. <laughs> Sean, while you're still talking, what do you think about the July Huck match? That game was weird. Because <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like, he doesn't think he's going to forget, but he is forgetting, so he canceled, then he got a... He got a forge. So that that's gonna July. I think he's gonna attack, but now July's thinking the Huck's gonna. And and at the end of the day, it was like July got to build a ton of drones and was never threatened ever. <laughs> um, I mean, I really think that um, Artosis did the correct move as a commentator to note the stylistic intricacy of July's style. Um, but July could have just made a lot of anything and would have been in great great shape. Uh, he was just way way ahead right as the gateways four and five went down. So can I say, Go ahead. for July versus Protoss, I think Scrap Station and Zelnaga are probably his two favorite playgrounds, because it's hard sometimes for Protoss to defend, to open one base and then defend your expansion, because your natural is like, well, on Scrap, it's obviously really far away, and you're dealing with a, an ultra-wide ramp. And then Zelnaga, it's, you know, everyone knows how these these bases look, it's it's harder to defend. And I think, really, what lost Huck the game, or at least was a ma the first major disadvantage for him that led to the other disadvantages was his inability to defend his Nexus. He had to cancel twice. Yeah. And I think he could have more aggressively defended. But he didn't know that he could do that. And, because uh, if you put your sentries out there, if you put your stuff out there, then you're in a position to land some more baller-ass force fields. But if the Zerg is going all in, then when you're out there, you're kind of screwed. If the Zerg has too much shit to kill you, then you go out there and you die. But if the Zerg only has enough stuff to delay your Nexus, and you sit back, then your Nexus gets delayed. So there's kind of this, you kind of have to guess. But I think he had hallucination at that point. I, I'd have to watch again. But it would have been pretty cool for him to be able to like hallucinate a phoenix, see exactly how many units July had, and then know where to position his stuff. Because the second cancel of the Nexus definitely could have been prevented by Huck, but he was sitting way back playing super safe. So from there, once that Nexus finally got up, I was like, how is he ever going to catch up? And then the Zerglings got the penetration on the sentries that were attacking the rocks, and I was like... yeah. All right, he's pretty dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then it happened again over at the third. Jeff, you got any thoughts on the uh, the July Huck match? No, um, I think Tyler took it all pretty good. All right, what about the uh, July Moonglade? Is there much to talk about in that match? I'm trying to. Mm. That's that's where uh, it didn't look pretty. That Moonglade went baneling, and July went expand Roach, right? Yeah. On metal cross map, I faintly remember that game. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Jeff? No. <laughs> <laughs> on a roll. Sean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts aren't amazing, but I mean, it's one of those things where that's one of the reasons why I really dislike doing some sort of roach, um, or excuse me, doing some sort of like Zergling <laughs> speed, Baneling bust in a lot of circumstances, because it's one of those strategies where it's like so incredibly fragile, like, especially against what July's doing. Cross yeah. map, and he opens roaches. Um, it's not that you can't win with it, it's just that, like, the wins are kind of never comfortable, and the losses are always really enraging, where it's like your baneling blew up, they're like, two of your banelings detonated right in his mineral line, and 100% of his workers now have five life, and that's what you did. <laughs> they're all gonna be fine in, like, two minutes when they heal back. Um... So yeah, it's kind of it was kind of a not a boring match, but it just wasn't a, a big highlight when all these other matches were going on. Did anyone watch yeah. the July Jinro match? Seemed like when we were talking earlier. Yep. Okay. 
You I watched that. Go ahead and talk about it, Sean, because I was so confused at how July got so far ahead in supply. In general, just had basically nothing when July attacked. Um, well, I mean, like, the mutilus harassment is so strong on, on Crevasse, because that backdoor is just super, super difficult to deal with. Like, you, cause, you know, in, in StarCraft 1, you can make some turrets, and you're going to be okay. But in StarCraft 2, turrets don't help you, because they'll get 40 <laughs> mutilus, and they'll have plus one. Um, there was that weird timing where Jinro just didn't have turrets right when mutilus popped. I think there was kind of this presumption that there might be some sort of gentle mutilus play eventually, yeah. as opposed to, like, the straight-up, yeah, I'm going mutilus in this game style that July was doing, which seems weird on three gas, but... I don't think it's unusual given the fact that, again, on crevasse, it's really hard to just defend your back door versus your front door. Like, even ignoring the fact that you have a main. Like, like your back door expo and then those front rocks are such a huge distance um, from the defender side that, I mean, just a couple of mutals can just murder. And so July just did the murder. And um, I think the only noteworthy thing after that is that July did the pretty cool um, turn all his zerglings into banelings and then get a lot of roaches, which is a little... Um, which is less common of a follow-up. It's not, like, unheard of, but it yeah. meant that that huge bus by July looked very scary. Yeah, I mean, he had, like, what, what was it, like, 90 supply of general compared to 160 of July, I think, right when that attack occurred. It just seemed... The game seemed really, really different from what I had expected. Um, but the next game after that was when Damaga decided he was going to be a complete badass and just start destroying nerds, taking out July on Shakuris. Um... Who, Sean, you want to take a stab at that? I'm not sure if... if didn't Tyler. see it. It's the only game I haven't seen. Tyler, did you watch that? I watched it, but... I, I mean, it's CBC. About CBC. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? Strike three? Strike three. Strike three. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake, well, you disconnects him from the call and we just continue <laughs> with the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that because it would mess up the webcam situation. I've already thought about it, but... <laughs> 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 MVP to Mog is probably the game... Uh, that a lot of people wanted to hear us talk about, but the fact that there was two is kind of weird. Um, so we'll talk about the first one, uh, the 46-minute game where there was like 10 planetaries in the middle of the game, yeah. in the middle of the map, and uh, Damaga opened up Ling and Fester, which I was really glad to see into Ultra. Cause no, he didn't. He opened up Expansion Spinecrawler and Fester. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is the awesomest thing in the universe, like, just infestors and expanding. He had so many bases so quickly, and had, like, 18 infestors and a control group of links, yeah. and it was so awesome, and then whenever he'd engage, he'd, like, neural parasite tons of stuff and do plague. I think that perhaps maybe not transitioning into ultralisks uh, and sticking to it all game long, especially on a map Ling of that size. Ling and Fester, you mean? Ling and Fester into Ultra. Oh. Uh, I would have liked to see a little bit more unit variety because I think that Damaga with his like eight bases versus MVP three could have gotten away with it. Yeah, but I mean we man. saw the, the spire go down, but then the game decided to crash. So <laughs> or MVP decided to disconnect. What, whatever it was that happened, we really uh, yeah. don't know the full story there. Um, but yeah, that was a, a crazy game. I, do they have both games posted of that? Do you know? It's all it's all under the set eight vod. You click on it, and just goes okay, right through. Okay, so all yeah, them. go watch that. Even even if it is. It does end in a disconnect for the first part. It was still a really, really good game to watch for Damaga. And then in the regame, Damaga just like, fuck it, I'm going to make like 7,000 Banelings and just destroy it. Yeah. But it was a weird Baneling timing because like he did a Ling Baneling bust with a layer and the Baneling speed, which is pretty atypical for, for your average Zerg buddy. So I don't think that um, MVP was as prepared as you know he would be if it was like a Morrow style uh, two hatch. Certainly, bailing bust, but even so, I freaking jumped. Now, you, you, when I brought up MC White Raw, you said that wasn't the game of the uh, of the event. What was it? The Demaga MVP for you, or was yeah, it? Yeah, because because the disconnect. That's what made it so good. Like the battle was when it's like core is waiting for players. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was probably the. The one moment where I think a thousand nerds were just screaming at their monitor and, and hating on Blizzard, but the game after that, since Damaga did I end up to. taking out MVP, was Nesty against Damaga on uh, Terminus Re, and Nesty never losing his EVZ on uh, South Korea. South Korean television still stands. But Sean, what do you think about the about that final match? 
I'm bummed. I'm really sad. I mean, I have absolutely no ability to analyze at all. I'm just like, oh, the world. Come on, the world. That would have been like the most gigantic victory of the West of all time. I think it's cool they came as close as they did, to be honest. Like, yeah. everyone was going like, oh, day two? Yeah, the Koreans have these players that they can't even touch. Wrong. <laughs> I mean, yeah. cool. they got thoroughly touched all day. It was <laughs> there was some touching. It's very true. It's very true. On the last game, Nest T went hatch first, right? Or did they both yeah, go hatch first? They both did. They both a little early expand to Ruha. Okay, and then Demaga. And then, yeah, Demaga did things <laughs> other than build only Zerglings and Roaches, and that cost him the game. Right, right. And then also the plus one played a factor in that too, but... Yeah, I'm real interested to see like more Infestor usage in that matchup because it's just so potent. Um, it's so good. It's so good. Like, seriously, going, like, Spinecrawler, Queen, and Fester at the start is, like, surprisingly good. Can I say... I would agree. It, um, does, do you guys just love the Winner's League format, or do you just love it? Like, for these... <laughs> <laughs> it's the I most would say it's the most format. exciting for sure. Like, the 1v1 League, awesome. it doesn't build up the... I mean, it doesn't build up the drama like this. The fact that... They like cut to the the teams and they throw out a player and there's always some type of celebration ceremony. It makes badass ceremony. look badass. Yeah, like, it, it really does. Yeah, it puts a storyline to the entire thing so much so that the the commentators don't even have to like create one about the two players in a one v one match. Yeah, the story yeah. is just amazing. It is. I I I definitely say it's the best format for StarCraft two to watch. Um, I people, I have no say in like yeah. if it's good to play in. So that that's on you guys if you enjoy playing in a. A one v one format, or if this is something you'd probably enjoy more. Um, well, I would say that you just kind of have to be really good, because that's like I personally am the sort of person that likes to say, okay, what do I have to worry about? All right, I will prepare for that. You know, like in all the WCGs, it was kind of like, all right, ninety percent of my time I'm practicing against Terran, because that's the only race I really have to worry about. Um, and it's really intimidating when, you know. Let's say there's a Zerg player who's out there, you know, like Moonblade, and you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to go out there, I'm going to play my best against Zerg. And then when you win, there's a kind of, what am I going to be up against next? It can be a little bit wearing. And if it's, like, on a map that you don't know, and you're good at, like, Zerg versus Terran, and Zerg versus Zerg, and then Protoss comes out, you're gonna, it can be a little more intimidating. But um, exactly as was said, badasses look very much more so. But that's badass. like, see, and I love preparing for a match far in advance, too. That's why I'm going to win this. TSL three, but <laughs> nowadays, like it's yeah, StarCraft two, you haven't competed StarCraft two day nine, and like it's so much different than Brood War because like every single tournament you show up to, like you have to be prepared for every single matchup, every single style, and every single map. It wasn't like we had in WCG with StarCraft one, where yeah, you kind of had to be prepared for everything, but you knew what you really had to be prepared for. It's not like that now. <laughs> So I think players are already like used to that because of this whole play a big ass tournament over one weekend format. It's very similar well, to Winners League format. I'd, I'd actually argue like kind of from an opposite angle that like in in the Korean competitive scene there is very little of the you have to go out there and do it. I mean like WCG yeah, yeah, yeah. was probably the from from the foreigner scene, like WCG was probably the strongest example of you actually do get to sit down and prepare for it. But I mean, yeah. like StarCraft Two, I think is still very similar to Brood War in that, like, especially in the West, that's pretty much how all the tournaments are out there. Um, have always been where it's just like, all right, you're thrown into the mix. Good luck, have fun, enjoy the grinder. Um, yeah. But I personally just, you know, even in all my years of Brood War experience, I still don't <laughs> like the sort of I, I don't like those huge, gigantic brackets and knowing you have to play like 50 games in a day. Yeah, I don't like those either. It's not it's not I'm not the biggest fan of it. But the Winners League, every time there's an underdog, you're like, oh, he's been preparing to snipe this player. Let's see what he has in store. And it's drama every single time. And you're Dude, it is. From an observer perspective, I could not agree with you more. From a player's perspective, I just, I want to win once and be like, all right, I'm going to sit down now. I'm going to be, I was yeah. champion for the day. I will, I will celebrate with a Twinkie, and it will be a delicious Twinkie, and I will indulge. Yeah. And if anyone else loses, I'll be like, well, I carried my weight. Sorry, guys. <laughs> to catch up to day nine, I don't want to have to be like July, where, you know, you win five matches and you lose a sixth one and you're like, you piece of shit. <laughs> you might cost us that series. That's true. That's true. I also want to say, 
I feel so bad for Moro, man. Losing the first match of the Winners League against any pro, and then in the round of 16, he's got to go up against MC. Yeah, dude, he's got MC. All he has to do is build an observer first. <laughs> got to get a war prism. And dude, let me tell you something. That first game, that first game between Moro and any pro, just like bummed me out. Like, so we're gonna sit here, and then Protoss is gonna get 40 gateways on three bases. He's gonna get 40 of them. And whenever he loses his whole army, he just sure. builds another 40 stalkers, and that was the game. Um, I heard Maro had, like, 89 drones or something in that match. He had, like, a crazy, crazy, crazy amount of them. But I, I will be entirely blunt when I say I really don't know how to play, like, a Roach Hydra style on a huge map. I really do not ever feel comfortable, because of exactly what happened in that game. Yeah, that Actually, was the I, one game I didn't I, watch. I vaguely remember thinking there was a way that Maro could have won. I'd have to rewatch the game, but I was thinking like this would be really hard to do, but I could see how Maro could have pulled this off and I was kind of like mad at the way any pro played. I was like, this doesn't deserve to win. Um dude, but, it was like it was so BGH, you know? It was like yeah, I'm gonna it was get BGH. like row yeah. and they're all gonna there's gonna be like a grid of them. <laughs> Thanks to <laughs> infinite building selection just, and like hold the Z button and <laughs> so, whoa, that graphic is messed up. Well, I guess you guys won't be seeing the actual round of 16. You'll just have to listen to us talk about it. Um, of any of the games going on tonight, we've got Huck MVP, July Nada, Son White Raw, and Damaga Nesty, the rematch. And tomorrow night's Marine King Sin, Moonglay TT1, MC Moro, Jinro Any Pro. Uh, for each one here, you guys each get to pick a match uh, that you're kind of most looking forward to. Tell me why. So, Tyler, you're up first. Um, kind of let's see. That. I'm gonna say Huck versus MVP is the one that I gotta pick because I feel like Huck lately he has something he needs to prove. Um, yeah. people weren't entirely convinced by his Code performance and his up down match performance, and um, he does get a lot he, of hate for some reason. Yeah, On he all does. The forums, he just gets <laughs> you a won, what a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's weird. I know, but he's like really, really good, and I want him on a big stage to you know have a really nice, good win. And MVP lately, and this is what's gonna happen. Let me just call it right now. Huck's gonna two zero MVP. It's gonna look awesome. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be like, <laughs> "Oh, MVP's so, TVP is terrible. Look at all the he's losing all of his TVPs. This doesn't mean anything." <laughs> and Huck's just gonna be like, "What do you want from me?" <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I can't win. Yeah, but this and I don't think MVP is that bad at TVP, and Huck I think has something to prove. So I'm really looking forward to this match because I think MVP has something to prove here. With his it's TVP a weird well. place to be. Like he loses that, <laughs> he somehow loses to MVP, and people will actually hold that against him. Like, wow, yeah. he lost to MVP in the first round of that tournament. It's like, dude, do you guys remember who MVP is? <laughs> dude, yeah. no, come on. Uh, like, seriously, uh, if MVP ever loses, he's off his game. He's been struggling. <laughs> but if MVP, if MVP pulls a win against, like, yeah. a, a top diamond Korean Protoss, and everyone's going to be like, MVP is the best player in the world! It's revolutionary <laughs> and everything. It's a, it's a surprisingly funky spot to be, but I'm not going to lie. That's what happens when you win a championship. Everyone's like, oh, he is the best player in the yeah. world. And it will take sure. years of horrendous results for people to start going... Not that good. Is he bad? <laughs> I mean, let, let, let me just say for the record, MVP's super fucking good. And you just have to look at him and be like, there's a really good player, and he wins some, and he loses some. Um, and if he loses, you can't just be like, but he's a champion. There were circumstantial things going on. <laughs> and you just, you lo- you, sometimes you lose, you know. Um, yeah. And that's just like such a weird spot to be in, where it's like, no, that's not a legit loss. That's like that's like point eight of a loss if you think about it. Twenty percent of that's kind of like a win because he's had his GSL title. <laughs> Jeff, what is the uh, the one match you're looking forward to in the round of sixteen? Um, you know, I've always kind of said that any foreigner that carries the torch and does really well is kind of the guy I'm going to be rooting for the hardest. And looking at this list, I, I look at White Raw versus Sand. And I think White Raw has an exceptionally good chance to advance over that. Yes, so yes, I, yes. And also, I think White Raw is a good <coughs> horse to back in this tournament for a guy who can represent foreigners really well. And he I is a he, horse. Yeah. yeah. But I think, I think yeah. he made mistakes against July. <laughs> otherwise, he has July dead. You know, and uh, I'm looking forward to him beating San here and then going deep in the tournament. And, I, and there, it could not happen to a better guy. 
He's like he is like the yeah. best person in the world, probably. People are constantly like, "Hey, how you train?" He's like, "Well, my wife lets me train, you know, about ten hours a day." He's like, "Does that piss you off?" He's like, "Piss me off! I get to play for ten hours a day." He's like the nicest guy in the whole world. <laughs> I know. I had like a, a ten minute conversation with him about drinking milk at IEM. <laughs> it was great because I was drinking Coke, and he's like, "No, I get up, I swim every morning, and then I drink milk." And I was like, "Oh." With, like, my fatty, fat Coke. It was uh, great. I, I wish White Raw was coming to, to Dallas this weekend, because conversations with him are always hysterical, no matter what the topic is. As our interviews, yeah. man, that is such an adventure oh, yeah. for the interviewer. The what interview was pretty awesome at, at GSL. Because <laughs> they, they were, like, asking him to, like, John, like, l- look, in, look into the camera and talk to your wife. And then he would, like, say something off camera and, like, look into the side. He's like, no, the camera, look at it. And he's like, I already, what are you talking about? I already said it. That was that was even more awkward than my interviews, which is. If you ever get a chance, ask him about his special tactics. Oh my god! <laughs> Looks like he, he won't employed some special about. tactics. <laughs> That's the best story ever. <laughs> Jeff, you want to tell us? Oh yeah, let's go. Noni, Artosis, Skew, G, all of us we used to play. Idra was in there. And Skew's a guy who a lot of people don't know about, but he was very good in Brood War. He famously lost to Yellow in a total of, I think it was three minutes, in the best of three, <laughs> yeah. uh, at a Blizzard Invitational. Um, but he played White Raw for some fairly big Brood War tournament, and he beats White Raw the first round. And White Raw, like we've been saying the whole time, is like the most mannered guy in the whole world. And White Raw literally says, I think it was actually streams, like way early in the stream, or maybe it wasn't, I, I can't remember, but he says, good game, go re. Uh, I use special tactics. It's no problem. And we're all like, it's so like, what? What? Because White Raw only says good game GLHF. That's it. But he's yeah. he's like going on about the special tactics. And we're like, I remember me personally being like, White Raw, what? What is special tactics? He goes, Oh, special tactics. You see, it's fine. And it's like, oh. Well, it turns out special tactics is two base, like twelve gateways, pure zealot dragoon. And uh, <laughs> just, just send them all in on a move command. Just and eventually kills. stop them. Yeah, just murders. Oh man, Skew, <laughs> Skew gets obliterated. Yeah, and I think he did it game three as well. Special tactics, <laughs> <laughs> codified in history forever as the coolest thing he's ever said. Yeah. Oh man, good old White Ross. Sean, what's the match you're looking forward to in round of sixteen? Uh. Uh, July Nada from the Brood War era. <laughs> How can I not get pumped about that? Um, I do want every single foreigner to just smash as a Korean opponent, however. I want those games to be, like, really not close. <laughs> I, th- yeah. I think Demog and Ness T, if Demog can actually win that series, would probably be <coughs> the biggest quote-unquote upset, if you can even call it that. Or at least take a game. That would <coughs> yeah, yeah be I mean, cause that would still be like, oh my god, Ness T is not invincible in ZVZ. On yeah. that, broadcasted yeah, matches, th- like one of the reasons that I want all the foreigners to win is because I actually know all of them, and I have heard a story yeah. from all of them. You know, That's like true. I don't know how MVP practices, but I do know that White Raw's wife is an influential component in that. Right, and that's just cool for me because I'm like, yeah, go White Raw. His little story there, and he like he like totally was. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you guys were. I know Tyler was a dream hack, but like um, White Raw brought his wife there. And, like, you could tell he just thought it was, like, the coolest thing in the whole world. <laughs> he was, like, here with his very own wife there. Um, That's awesome. So that was great. Yeah, so I just, every time I, like, see him playing, I just want to, I just want it to be, like, a little stool for just, like, a, his wife to just sit there and, like, cross <laughs> and, like, watch him. Because he really, he, like, involves his whole body when he plays. I've never actually sat like, there and watched him play in a tournament or anything. I figured he'd just be, like, a really calm, calm guy, but... He's, 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 a, he's a consummate pro. The guy's been around forever. He's been to every tournament, places in like the top five of every single one of them. That has ever happened, yeah, for, since like 2000. It's like absurd how long he's been around. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, because I, I just, I kind of want foreigners to win because I know them, and because, and because I'm a foreigner. That's true, that's true. Well, you can watch the first four matches, uh, Huck MVP, July Nada, uh, San, White Raw, Damaga, Ness T tonight. I think they're starting in about four hours from now. Um, I guess I'll have to catch the VODs for that because I got to fly out tomorrow. But uh, oh, that'll be yeah. that'll be awesome. Probably watch those tomorrow at the hotel. But uh, here's an open-ended question: Do we want to move on to TSL three, or have we done enough analysis to uh, where we can talk <laughs> about MLG Dallas for now and move on to that after? Yeah. If you don't talk about TSL three, there's gonna be a lot of well, somebody else. We're will. we're gonna go like super in depth into each of the the games 
as as per request of one Liquid Tyler. Um, but we can't just jump into MLG Dallas to start things off with, with I think is what we're going to do. Do MLG okay. Dallas real quick. And yeah, because we've really... We jumped into the uh, the group, or the, the pools last week, so if you want to get our thoughts on that with, uh, with Sock on the cast, you can. Um, but they did announce the open players today. If I can find this link real quick. Um, can I also make a quick announcement? Yeah, go ahead while I find this. Last Shadow, Team Gosu Gamers. Oh yeah, he's back. I saw that. It wasn't apparently the Last Shadow. <laughs> it was the second to Last Shadow. But now we are for sure in the realm of the Last Shadow. <laughs> so, uh, Green, Reaper, SCB all ins. Yeah, you thought you'd, you'd see the last of them? Yeah. Yes, again. Well, we'll see him. Wait, is he going to be at Jalice? No, he'll be at Future oh, events after that, I you think. never know, man. If I could have saw him versus Naniwa, like, first round, <laughs> oh my God, that would have like been heaven. Just bumps and Naniwa snaps the yeah. table half and <laughs> So, yeah, exactly. Naniwa, Nami, well, Nama, Grubby, Destiny, and Cruncher are making their quote-unquote debut MLG appearance. Um, and then there's a ton of other notable players. Find well, so is Sheth. Why isn't Sheth under the debut? Mm -hmm. Debut. Yeah. Well, he's going to be there. He's, he's not he going to show up. I mean, he debuts a couple times a year. <laughs> <laughs> if he shows up, it'll be his debut MLG appearance. But he's in California, <laughs> right, Jeff? Sheth? No, absolutely not. He's. Uh, I thought he was out there a while back. Lives back with his. I. You know, the Sheth story actually is like really convoluted. It's hard to follow. But I thought he was in California. Uh, I. I have looked Sheth in the eye. He has been to a land in Michigan. Um. I think he's going to be here. I. If if I were a gambling man, and I'm, you know, I, I I'm not going to take that bet. I could look like a son. huge idiot, but I think he'll be there. He is the one unknown in the StarCraft II world. That's for sure. Tyler, is he going to show up? Yes. <laughs> yeah. There. Yes. Sean. What, what? Chef's not going to show. <laughs> Here's another no. big story for for uh, MLG Torch Torch Gaming will be there. And Is he going to be there though? Like I I thought he was going to stay in in Korea. Now that he's uh, back over there. He's like flame on man. He shows up in places. All right, he <laughs> flies true. faster than a speeding bullet. He just showed up at Pax East out of nowhere. So you, you do have a point there. Um, I uh, if I can gather up the courage, I will say flame on. I'm going to reinstate the joke. I said I'll it to him at Pax. It, you got Stone Cold Stone Face, right? He was just kind of like, heh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we to We're going to build on that. He <laughs> went on to the next topic. Uh, but how do you guys think Grubby's going to do? He's been playing a shit ton of games, streaming a ton. Uh, this will... What, was he at a European event? Yeah. So this He's will be his first... Assembly. He faced Tyler. He faced Tyler. Yeah. Group. He didn't get out of his group. So how do you guys think he's going to do? <laughs> wow, Tyler. how do you guys think he's going to do over here in the states at, at MLG Dallas? Is kind of his uh, North American StarCraft II debut. Ask Tyler. He's faced him. He's Tyler, let's I hear it. The you like the shit on Protoss, so let's hear it. No, I I I've watched his stream a little bit, and he really is coming along very quickly. But I don't. He definitely doesn't have like a rock solid style, and it's going to be hard for him to get through that whole bracket, especially when. He probably isn't completely familiar with the way a lot of North American players play. And when he's already not doing the safest stuff, uh, it's going to be even harder. So he definitely has some of the skills to beat um, a lot of top players, but can he get through the gauntlet that is the open games. portion <laughs> yeah, of MLG? I don't it's, know. It's, it's a 200-person round robin in the open bracket. <laughs> might as well be. It might as they well take be. top eight. <laughs> Jeff, I'm going to throw you this question because you'll give it to me how Good. it is and I'm very excited to hear your answer How is one Stephen Bunnell <laughs> aka Destiny oh, going to do it MLG Dallas You know, I'm trying to be like a straight PC guy now who everyone likes nobody has a problem with You ask me that question Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Bunnell is an entertaining and fantastically dedicated gamer. He had a child who is now called Destiny's Child. I think that's awesome. <laughs> um, he streams actively, and he has the fan base to, to show for. It. He is a he's a gentleman and a scholar. Wait, that last part was a complete lie. Um, he's 
he's going to bomb. He's going to get defeated. He will be <laughs> defeated at MLG. And it's not because I have anything against him. I don't. I think he's a great guy. Um, but I think he suffers from the cat syndrome minus the cat's uh, glamour. Like, cats is able to do these abstract Oh, I thought you said the cat syndrome. I was like, what? It is. The cat syndrome. The cat's... <laughs> Cat does weird strategies. <laughs> Hang on, let me let me explain this, JP, before you <laughs> get locked on cat syndrome here. I, I didn't hear uh, the Z uh, is what I'm trying to say, but continue on, man. I, okay. <laughs> and uh, he does weird strategies, but he's able to execute them because he's been doing it for a long time. He kind of understands it. Look at the chat. This is so amazing. Just keep just keep going, man. I'm like so distracted. By these. They're so angry right now. Does not exist. What? Yeah. Destiny will do amazing. He's he's actually in the third round of one tournament before. Okay, anyways, if we keep uh, talking about him, he'll tell a stream to come over here, which will make us look good. So yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the media mogul. All I have is good say. for the numbers, bringing yes. the eyeballs in control. <laughs> we played two games with Destiny in the last like month or two, and they weren't good. They were not. Tyler, I'm gonna put you on the spot too. Destiny and MLG. I don't. He's not gonna get to the championship bracket. I'll just say that. Here, here is another question. He's not gonna get through. I'm just. I'm trolling up a storm tonight. Is he gonna get farther than HD did in Dallas? <laughs> yes, of course. He's much yeah. better than HD for God's he's, sake. Yeah, he's better than HD. I mean, like HD is is not. I mean, he plays and that's great. But I mean, like Destiny actually like really tries to compete hard. So I mean, yeah. See, now you're blown out of proportion. Destiny is not like. Well, JP's trying to get us to He's say that, to, know, that Destiny's to. absolutely terrible at this game, and we're not going to say that. Well, well, it's because <laughs> he's, he's not. not. Yeah, he's no. not. Okay, all right. <laughs> but there are there are there are tiers of players, and break it down, I don't, Tyler. Yeah, I don't think Destiny <laughs> is a guy who could at beat the top is Ryu. <laughs> it's like you <laughs> troll. <laughs> <laughs> there's me, and then there's MC. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a lot of other oh, people. Oh man, that IP is starting to hit. Um, <laughs> no, but like, I think Destiny has a lot of stuff to learn, and his mechanic. I th well, here's the thing: he needs to practice a lot more while he's not streaming, which I don't. He's not going to do because uh, he he likes to stream. He needs to stream. He wants to stream, so he's going to stream. But I think he needs to put his head down and get his mechanics better. I've watched his stream quite a bit. He's fun to watch. I like to hear he's him talk while he plays. When I'm not doing anything else, uh, uh, I'll look, watch look, 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 deserve me. No, <laughs> goddamn, no. Yes, 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 family, yeah. yes. But his mechanics are just not there yet. So, They're people, not. yeah, just, uh, I don't know. Trying to think. Next topic. Do we, do we need to discuss Nanny Wall at all? Is he, is he a big he's thing? A big he's a really, he's a damn good player. He's like one of the best in Europe right now. He might be, well. yeah, he might be one, maybe the best player coming from the Open. I'll go so far as to say that. He might be the best player coming from the Open the open tournament. Sounds good. What I'm about looking through the list, and I mean, there's a lot of good players, yeah, and yeah. I can't say that definitively, but I think he is really, really good. Uh, the, the last <laughs> player that I'll touch on is Cruncher. Um Coming off of a, a hot win, obviously, over Idra this past weekend. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but how do you guys think he's going to do at his uh, his first MLG? We'll, we'll throw this to Jeff first and then get Tyler. We should stream up. Tyler versus Destiny after this, too. <laughs> <laughs> what did you ask me? <laughs> Cruncher, like a Cruncher how's he going to do at MLG? He's going to do great. He's definitely going to make it through uh, the lower bracket thing. Um... Oh. You know, I my, my concern with him is that he likes to do a lot of pretty risky builds. So if he tries to get too fancy and in, in the unnecessarily in the lower brackets, I feel like he could get kind of you know he could lose a round, which would be unfortunate. But when you watch him play, it's easy for people. You know, he's kind of a I don't know how this happened, but I guess he's considered a controversial. Like I asked Greg last night, I was like, yeah, I was like, what did he say to you? Because everyone's saying it's so so bad. And he's like, uh, he smiled at me. And I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> did he offensively smile? Like, instead of typing GG, just like this smiley face? He's like, no, he said it in the chat before the game started. And I was like, what? Like, I, I don't understand how this happened, but our community is so sensitive. Because, 
That's like not bad at all, guys. Like no, I, I thought he said he it said at the end of the he game. He said it at the end of the game. Right when it was clear he was gonna win, he said he put a happy face. Yeah, out. it was like oh, when so you would offensive it. GG it was he wrote a smiley instead of an oh, offensive no. GG. It's just sensitive enough. Okay, so Greg's an idiot then, because I asked him that. <laughs> I, like that would be kind of mean to an offensive smiley face. But after a guy calls you a, uh, a walkover round, I, I would smile too. Yeah, I don't think that's Greg true. was insulting him between the games too. I don't know if you saw Crunchy yeah. like posted screenshots that he took of the like in-game chat between games, you know? Yeah. And uh, like Greg was talking shit in that's between Greg does. both no, games. Uh, part of me wants uh, just just for the sake of things being very very funny. It would be great <laughs> if Cruncher played against like a high-rated Diamond Zerg and barely lost one-two and was eliminated. But at least he beat Idra. <laughs> like one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of That'd funny. There's awesome. there's so many players that have made a name for themselves simply by beating Idra. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Silver. Wait, you go down. Mask. Silver <laughs> Mask. They're yeah. Like, almost all the players at MLG who Drew like be. suddenly Drew got his start from Idra. Yeah, he's actually beat oh. him a lot in GSTL, hasn't he? In, in past events. Uh, I don't know what the GSTL is. I think that's or not the, not the GCPL. GCPL. The GCPL. Sorry, yeah. Did he beat him at GCPL? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It was before actors. that. It was like during the beta. They played that infamous game on Kulaz Ravine when Greg said apologize for playing that race. Or no, that was Silver. <laughs> that was. But the, it's funny that we all remember the losses by how Greg responded to him with. <laughs> I know. Greg, Greg, literally. <laughs> that was the thanks or apologize hey. for playing that race. <laughs> like, see, here's the so, quiz. When did Greg say the carriers were a useful skill toy? Have. <laughs> No one's I know this. I'm that was the tournament that sent him to... Or sent no, him no, to no. no. Do you know his what? opponent? Just, Do you know his opponent? It was Draco. Yeah. Uh, everyone? Yeah. Everyone needs to go get on to... Uh, what was that China tournament? You need to Google it. <laughs> or Liquipedia it. Because that's, that's just a fact that you just need to know. It's true. I don't it's even... An it I, is an important I just repeat the meme. I don't actually know the full story. Well, I know the story of it, but I don't know where it happened. But Greg literally, like, he he's like a wizard of the internet, though. Like, when he misses a high five, it sends echoes throughout all of the tournaments. It's like, and Greg, actually, the best part about this is I had the privileged perspective of talking with him behind the door, you know, behind the closed doors, and he's like, you know, that look on my face, that's me realizing that that picture will forever be, be eternalized. He, he said the same thing to me, too. He knew it. He knew it the second it happened. He was like, "Ah, oh, son of a bitch." Yep. That That's true, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Cannot wait for for Andrew to play against Sock and Kiwi Cocky to start things off on Friday. That'll be exciting stuff. What are you guys most looking forward to at MLG? Uh, I I I want to I want to step in once more and just note that like I don't think anyone would really care about these losses that Andrew takes. He didn't make the biggest deal about him. Well, so, yeah, yeah. All these things. And it's just like, it's such a tragedy because, again, kind of like what I was saying earlier, MVP is just going to lose games sometimes because, you know, even if you're the best in the world, there's a lot that you don't know. So, like, yeah, yeah. Idra lost to Cruncher. You know what happens? But now the whole world's just like, oh, he said he was going to be alive. Oh, my God. Now, if Cruncher yeah. doesn't win MLG, he's probably going to get shit for it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> just. <laughs> All right, Tyler, what are you look most looking forward to this weekend? Dude, I'm so excited about StarCraft 2 players being stars at MLG now. We're going to have, like, we're not going to be away in the corner, right? It's true, we're, we're, not, have we're not in the dark corner. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. We're Except me and, Sean are get, me, Sean, and Wheat will be in the the dungeon, so to speak. You'll never see us. Uh, well. By the dungeon, the VIP lounge. There's actually a castle <laughs> <of> jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be casting, casting from, a jacuzzi. from a jacuzzi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sean lets the cat out of the bag. But there's the big surprise. Can't even talk about it anymore. <laughs> so good. Jeff? No, it, it's going to be awesome. Jeff, what are you most looking forward to? Me, man. I I am <laughs> not... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be there. It's going to be cool. No, I can't I'm wait really to see me at the airport. We're riding in a taxi together. <laughs> oh, my God. It was really funny when I said that. <laughs> it was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to me. It was. I know. It's like that time when I said that one thing. But yeah. <laughs> Continue on, Jeff. Why, uh, why are you most looking forward to yourself at MLG? See how you're going to do? 
I have a big monkey on my back, man. Zero major tournament wins in StarCraft 2. And I have a group that I feel like I could do very well in. And I'm already in the top 16, so I'm kind of in striking position of already doing very well. But, you know, I could also get dominated by these really good players, too. So I'm very apprehensive to put my work uh, to the test and to do really well. So, yes, I'm most excited to see how my work pans out at this very important tournament. There you go. Short, shorthand me. <laughs> Sean, what are you most looking forward to uh, to MLG Dallas? Casting with DJ Wheat. Yeah, I love casting with Wheat. That's totally going to be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Wait, JP, aren't you casting? I am, but uh, we're just going to let this go. Love casting well, with DJ Wheat. He's such like a good person. You're all right, too, JP. But I'm all right. Honest, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to cast with a variety of other casters as well at the tournament. <laughs> hey, I, JP's been practicing. Haven't you been watching those vods, dude? JP's been training hard. MLG practice cast. Yeah, and they're labeled because it's like practice cast eight. Let's yep. just like another seven other. Yeah, yep. eight was the last one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but to, to answer the question, actually, honestly, <laughs> instead of to do the counter troll, bam, uh, is, is is actually casting with someone in real life is so overwhelmingly better than casting with someone over the internet. It is so great just to be able to. It's a lot easier too. First. Wait yeah. a second. What what are you casting over the internet that you don't enjoy as much? Day nine. Any cast I've ever done with another commentator over the internet. I read I read between the lines. I know what you're really between saying. It. You mean the Team Liquid Star League? I'll say it. There's no one else in my room but me when I'm doing that, and that bums me out. Team Liquid really needs to fly wheat to my house every one of those casts, but they're cheapskates. I agree. They can do it over team speak. All right, Tyler. It's time for uh, TSL 3 <laughs> Talks. Let's do it. You want to start with day three first? Is that where you want to begin? MVP Adele Scott? Yeah. Sounds logical. All right, man. Let's shit on Adele Scott. Here we go. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was back in that horse, man. He's my horse. What did I say last week? Well, and what did Jeff respond to that? I said, "Look, I'll give, I'll give him a thirty, Tyler. forty percent chance to win." And then Jeff, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tyler, oh. Okay, so I'm what? Sorry. What happened? What happened? Maybe Jeff should start it out. What happened in that series? Dude, I'll, let me just jump in here and say that Adele Scott's my <laughs> hero. I've been talking about that guy since beta. Bam! I mean, there you go. Play, 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 play. I've been saying that like he's his own worst enemy, and once he just stops. And just like getting nervous and choking and all that stuff, he will be a beast of beasts, and he was, and he brought out the thump. Hey, but I got—I'll be critical though, and this is what I said last week. I said I, his late game mechanics—I'm not a huge fan of them. He has brilliant openings, brilliant game plans, but and even though the, the casters were doing their job and saying, "Wow, his positioning is so good and stuff," his unit control is awesome. It really wasn't the best, and his macro could have been a little bit better. And uh, if he, he had like two K one point five K a couple times yeah, there, like if could've... he if he had like the best mechanics in the world, he would be fucking unstoppable. <laughs> so I think he should stop thinking for a while and just play like a robot, and then get his <laughs> mechanics, and then he can start thinking again and just win everything. I <laughs> and yeah, I got a lot of slack because I obviously was like, oh, MVP's got that, but. Here's my safety net, and I, I put this in place very specifically. <laughs> I said, any foreigner that beats a Korean, I will gladly eat my words, and I will be their biggest fan. And I'll tell you what, you cannot watch that Adel Scott match without getting super effing excited. I thought he was completely dead in that yeah. Metalopolis game. I was like, yes, uh, okay, well, he's got <laughs> units in everywhere. He's just dead. And then he started surging back, and I was watching it with Anne, and I was like, I was, like, shaking her by the shoulders. I was like, Anna, Anna, this is so ridiculous. And she's like, no, Adel Scott. Like, stop shaking it. I was, like, shaking it. Anna. <laughs> You're so amazing. I, I, will, I, I will take every single amount of flack because I deserve it. Because I'll tell you what, if, if my flack produces through some kind of cosmic device the karma to generate a game like that, then uh, I, will be the, I will be the horse's ass every time, dude. That was so amazing. I'm so happy for him. Sean, you've probably been the biggest supporter of Adele Scott ever since you yeah. casted. I th did you cast this game first, or were you? Did you I didn't. have one of his dailies, or have 
feature him on one of your dailies first. I forget. Oh, oh, you, um, I actually, I, I want to say that I featured him on a daily, but um, it was actually like the second turn when I ever cast it in beta. Um, it was a Zotac Cup. It was like Zotac Cup number four, and he was in in um, Protoss vs. Terran when people were still kind of like one basing because they realized you know they could win a game with a Colossus and that's something that was it. That's the only <laughs> unit they needed. They needed one Shit. Colossus. Um, he was going like nine gateway, three base, one gas, just like only Zealot Stalker, and it was so cool to watch that like. Um, it's back when his name was just Adele um, in, in his matches. And um, yeah, and then I started doing more dailies on him and just talking about how boss mode was. And a lot of my Protoss to this day is inspired by those early games from the Zotac Cup. Or <coughs> watching just be so gateway heavy. Tyler, you want to move on to uh, QXE and just talk about game two? Forget game one? Sure. <laughs> um, what a hero was QXC. Like, oh my god. He was so far behind. He was far behind after that DT opening. And, I was and then like, he thought, I better get a nuclear missile. <laughs> Dude, before we ever even talk about that game, we gotta talk about the other, like, I feel like... The Taldry Monster uh, game? Yeah, like, I, I feel like, I don't know, Genius, his, his decisions and stuff were immediate. I don't mean to be, like, I don't know, a jerk or something, but I don't feel like he had lag problems that bad. I really feel like QXC outplayed him. <laughs> like, straight up, man. Uh, the Phoenix seemed pretty yeah. crisp. There's no times where there's, like, a Phoenix just dawdling there, taking extra fire. They were really, really vicious. And I have no idea how QXC clawed back in two of those games against those those uh, Phoenix. Since lag was mentioned, I have to give my short little spiel <laughs> about the lag issues Yes, whenever a European played against a uh, Korean, and QXC was in Europe for this, so this was the case for him, too. All the games were played on North America. People are saying, you know, connection from Korea to North America is worse than from Europe to North America. Here's the deal. It's much worse to be unfamiliar with a latency than to play in a high latency. And you guys should really go to the TSL forum on Team Liquid and look for a post by Jinro called On the Topic of NA to KR Lag. The thing is, if the Koreans would play maybe 30 to 40 games on North America server just leading up to their match, and this doesn't have to be ladder, they can get their buddy their Korean buddy to come on North America server too and practice, prepare for a big-ass match like a TSL match is, they get used to the latency, and it might be a little bit higher, but if they're familiar with it, they're going to be super comfortable, and it's going to be fine. Yeah, and, and, and I, as a matter of fact, uh, let me jump in real fast and let sure. you not finish by sure. saying that he said that there was someone who told him something about the consistency of lag. Uh, that was actually me who told him about a research study that was done um, because, you know, there's a lot of interest now in um, having people, you know, play games via server side and that sort of thing instead of, like, via client side. And it's so tempting to just give the, the client information as quickly as possible, as quickly as the Internet will allow. So let's say that that range is between 50 milliseconds and 250 milliseconds or something like that. Um but you know, generally it's around 50, but occasionally it'll, it'll, it'll fluctuate. That is really hard for the human mind to deal with, that it's much better to just fix it at 250 milliseconds, even though that is the absolute worst. With no fluctuation, the human mind's always cool, and it's way, way, way more comfortable uh, with that. So, so exactly like what you're saying, that it's yes. really important that someone play and just get that rhythm down, because there is a sort of shoot, fire, shoot, fire, shoot, fire, that like exact timing of the, of the marine marauder that you need to get, and if you need yeah. to stagger that a little bit, then then you need right. to account for that. Right, you can still kite perfectly on higher latencies. You just need to be familiar with it. You need to know that you're playing on a higher latency. It needs to be fairly consistent, and the latencies are consistent. They are a little bit higher, and I think it's just a little bit of lack of preparation. And in fact, this is what most people don't know. I know for a fact that Team Liquid as baller-ass uh, as they are at hosting tournaments, they told the Koreans, look, the latency might be uncomfortable for you. If you play quite a bit on North America server to prepare, you'll be much better off. If you don't have a North American account, we'll provide you guest accounts just to practice, get familiar with the latency. And as far as I know, 
probably no one really took advantage of that. I don't know which Koreans, if any, actually played on North America server to get used to it, but I hope now that the word is kind of out, the Koreans that are remaining... <laughs> After they've already will, uh, lost, except for... <laughs> yeah. Except for, like, MC, Boxer, and... and Nada. Yeah. yeah, Nada. Yeah, but I mean... It's it's kind of the fault of the Koreans. They might not have known better. Who would think that, you know, they're probably just like, latency is going to be bad, I'll just have to deal with it. No. You They'll can prepare know now. For it, prepare for it, yeah. You guys like probably that. did that for the NASL. Like they're yeah, for, NASL for NASL, yeah. Hopefully the Koreans are ready for the latency. They put some time on North America server. We'll see them play a lot better. Anyway, back to the games. JP, take us away. <laughs> it's a good spiel to have, though, because I feel like... Uh, they had to learn the hard lesson. <laughs> Did uh, it was it was latency? Those were two zeros. Like Goody beat Nesty for God's sake. I mean, we'll get to it in a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are, are we done with uh, QXC Genius, Tyler? Um, well. Did the other guys criticize Genius enough? I don't want to criticize <laughs> every single Protoss ever, but <laughs> <laughs> I know the Jesus came down. Oh, his his divine powers like managed to defeat an army of Zerg single handedly. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the flaws Jesus had in his play. I'm not as comfortable <laughs> with his late game upgrade transitions. What about Jesus the? Uh, he has time to practice. Yeah. There's no latency from heaven to the North American series. Tyler is such a boss. <laughs> what about he all those is. late game reapers? Was that? That was, dude. Let me tell you something. QXC treads a fine line between being an aggressive genius and pulling his way back in the game and sacrificing huge amounts of units for free. <laughs> and it yeah. is, and it is, and I'm not saying like, lol, QXC is a luck based nerd. It's that, like, the way he plays stylistically, you have to have thousands of stupid, annoying losses where you're like, maybe now's a good time to attack with eight Reapers. And you go up, and there's just fungal growth, and, <laughs> and he catches all of them, and you just want to die. Um, and you do. But, like, um, it was really cool to see QXC do his really aggressive style that he loves, but not make a lot of the mistakes that I've experienced him do. It was so, so, so nice to, like, see him, like, not just, like, I have a medevac, so I'm dropping, because I, I mean, I have a medevac, you know, that, that, his timing was just super cool, so I do love the late game Reaper transition, because it just makes a lot of sense, uh, again, Protoss constantly having to have their Colossus ball, like, nice and clustered together, because it's too dangerous to split up, and him just really forcing the split up, and the yeah. nukes! Did anyone else just go do this? Nukes. Like, that's all I did for like 15 minutes. I always have to hold my breath because nukes are either the coolest thing ever or the, biggest or the thing stupidest ever. weight I've ever seen. So I'm like, oh, yeah, but then I'm like, like, oh, what if that's what? stupid? Tor Torch TLO yeah. at MLG. Oh my god, the poor guy. <laughs> the poor guy. The worst, I mean, the thing about that was that was like a nuke rush that was always never going to work, but, but QC was doing late game and I liked it, but, uh, you know. Genius is on top of his game. I don't think a single one landed on the probes that he wanted him to. And the thing about nukes is that they'll either kill every unit it ever touches, or it'll do, like, 15 damage to a geyser. <laughs> but if you yeah. drop, like, four nukes on an assimilator, it'll be totally fine. Like, man, we got shooken up over there just a little bit of while ago. It's like three nukes fell. Thank God the shields were charged. <laughs> so, so I gotta say... Another one. QXC style, I love the constant aggression. The thing about Zelnaga, though is that if you end up with a split map, then the guy who's been aggressively trying to kill your probes and slow down your mining, well, eventually you might mine everything anyway, and then the player who's been more efficiently killing stuff is the one who's going to win. So for me, it, 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 like, it was even better as a spectator, because I was like, okay, QXC is trying to slow down his mining. If the map gets mined out, if it really goes late, late, late game, he's going to be kind of in trouble. He's trying to slow down mining and then hit a timing. And it was, like, really exciting. So strategically, I was just like, QXC, I don't know about this. What if he's <laughs> able to just stabilize and then mine out his map and you get mined out first because you're goddamn mules and then you're just out of money? <laughs> but uh, it was super exciting. Zell Naga, though, I think maybe he should scale back the aggressiveness a little bit. <laughs> These bigger, bigger maps, like QXC's aggressiveness, that's just scary. Like, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see him try it out on bigger maps. No one's been critical of Genius yet, Tyler. I think we're just going to have to have this fall back on you. Oh, uh, he's bad. <laughs> genius. <laughs> How ironic is that? No, Tyler, people people know you're joking. you got to say it for real so that they'll actually be pissed. No, well, a lot of people on the forum were like, 
he what is he doing? Like he's making bad decisions. That was the one game where at first everyone's like, oh, latency, blah blah, latency, 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 and then a lot of there's this wave of people that was like, but genius is like doing dumb things. So can you blame <laughs> that on latency? So I'm just it was, so, it was lagging so hard I just didn't upgrade ever. Yeah, it was it was kind of bad from him. Like I kind of feel like maybe he didn't put in a full effort. I'm not gonna say that was like indicative of his skill level. It was a really bad showing, though. Jeff, you brought up Goody Nesty, so we're going to throw this to you to start off with. Yeah. Awesome. I like Just in, in, in... I'll talk about that specifically, but in summary of all these games, that had to have been the most exciting and best day of StarCraft II observing I've ever had. I, I mean, oh, obviously man. that's not as epic of a statement as it would be for Brood War because it's a longer time, but up until this day... I was sitting on my laptop, had my beautiful, wonderful girlfriend on my right. We were we were at the beach, uh, and and her whole family. Okay, we're at a beach house. Sorry. Okay. And uh, her whole family buzzing around, and they're like, "Don't you play that game when you're back at home?" And Anna would speak for me. She's like, "Mom, this is like the Super Bowl for Jeff. You need to you need to give him space." And uh, I it was so amazing, like. We just talked about QXC beating Genius. Do you guys remember the talks before that? It was like, oh, well, QXC's dead. He can't beat a Protoss, let alone Genius. <laughs> LOL. Crushed him! Uh, d- down the line, you know, MVP. Freaking MVP losing to a Frenchman who's not Elky. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> Crushed him. And and now Goody. And the best part about that was all the, the memes, the, like... The Panzer General. Yeah, they're like, oh, he makes tanks, he makes tanks. Guess what Goody made? He made freaking tanks, man. <laughs> He made tanks, and he made tanks, and he made tanks. It was so awesome. And, uh, I mean, the one thing I feel bad about is I feel like Nesty played, like, shit. Like, I feel like he played bad. And uh, I feel like, you know, if he plays, like, super serious, epic Nesty style and Goody still wins, it's, like, the most amazing match I've ever seen in my life. But I felt like Goody was the better player the whole time, guys. Like, it reminded me of Thorazane Fruit Dealer. Like, uh... The oh, Thor Zane match, Thor there was Zane. never a question. Thor Zane was the better player in that best of three. Hands down, the better player. God, that was just so hot. And yeah, <laughs> like I literally watched that and I was like, because I was I was in San Francisco at the time, uh, with a whole bunch of other programmers teaching one and stuff and, and we were like, Wow. Uh like there was never a question. Thor Zane was always gonna win that match. And Goody, you know, he was on the ropes, there's a couple times, there's that weird base trade situation thing, it was really scrappy, but uh, Goody crushed him, I felt like. I mean, not necessarily crushed him, it was a closer series, but I, he just... Goody is like, going into TSL, people would consider him like the second tier top non-Korean, you know, like, yeah. not a guy yeah. who enters the tournament and everyone's like, oh, wow, Goody's in there, he's gonna crush the thing. No, he's a guy who, like, can win a round or two. I think Dane Ines actually talked about this famously many a time. In fact, during the cast, I think I'm stealing his content right now, but... Uh, really? I, I said that. I think so. I mean, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. That's probably always dangerous. No, no, go for it. Because if it's, if it's really well-worded, it's totally what I said. <laughs> well, you know, I just felt like you... you I, again, maybe I'm totally wrong, but the sentiment is that Goody's not a guy who enters a tournament everyone's like, oh, Goody's going to win. But here oh, he is, yeah. taking out the best Zerg on the planet. You know, how cool is that? Yeah, no, that's actually, like, def- I, I definitely did say something relatively <laughs> close to that, but there's, like, a number of Terran players in the tournament who are, who are a couple of those, like... Um, uh, like, solid, who, like, in a tournament, if you saw their name, you'd be like, yeah, of course, he's going to be in the tournament. Um, but not, like, champion caliber players that, you know, where you would see an Idra, and you'd be like, ooh, he's a contender for the first place spot. Um, uh, the, the first one I most notably said that about a lot was Thorzane, um, and yep. Goody's son as well. And I'm so happy those two guys <laughs> just did a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of wrecking in their first round games. Tyler, do you want to talk about Nest T. Goody? Do you want to move on to... Uh, uh, just move on. They covered <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, well, here you go. <laughs> it's uh, another Protoss. Let's see how you handle this one, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> one? Nanny Wall so versus Rhett, man. Um, oh, man, Rhett. Come on, Rhett. 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 A lot of people <laughs> wanted you to win, Rhett. And, like, we're all just like, oh, Rhett, what are you doing? I don't know. I think Rhett could have won. Naniwa played pretty well. Uh, like I said, going into MLG, I think Naniwa's a beast. Um, but Rhett, that was totally winnable for Rhett. I don't know if we were going to go into specifics, <clears throat> but uh, that's my summary. 
what do the other guys want to say about it? Can I ask you about an interesting storyline for the TSO? Okay. Uh, was it six Team Liquid members enter round one? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. One advance? All six of us. <laughs> Yeah, dude, it's rough, man. We're slumping a little. Obviously, bit. Obviously, it's a it's a Star League for God's sakes. You know, it's like it's not like this is the first round of a Jim Bob's fifty dollar tournament <laughs> for the week. But <laughs> yeah. uh, what we're trying to say is that you're the best player in Team Liquid, Tyler. Uh, I don't, can we make that statement now? That's the first one, Tyler. Best of America, Reagan, <laughs> whole thing, easy yeah. peasy. Uh, but number two, there were a few okay, like Huck versus Hasuabs. A lot of people would think Huck should win that. Mauro versus yeah. Jinro. Jinro should have probably won that. I mean, Mauro's no slouch, obviously. Um, right. Rhett versus Naniwa, I think a lot of people would look at that and think Rhett should have won. I think the people that are closer to it probably know that Naniwa's like unstoppable PVC right now. He's actually playing insanely good, so that'd be a little bit tougher. A- and I think Rhett's pretty depressed with uh, ZVP, from what I gather. Yeah, he, I think he is. <laughs> he puts that out there pretty strong anyways. Um, but that's tough. You know, I, I hate to be the. I mean, obviously, I don't hate it because obviously I, I deserve all the hate that I'm going to get for bringing that up. But that's, that's you got to <laughs> talk about that. It's the team liquid tournament. Six guys enter, five guys down, one guy advances. It's pretty, pretty severe. <laughs> yeah, I, obviously, I was hoping for better. I, I mean, I don't want to like call out specific teammates <laughs> here and be like, you really should have won that. But uh, <clears throat> pretty much, uh, we're we're kind of you know. We need some good results this weekend. Basically, I think Team Liquid is, is in, a, in a bit of a slump. And uh, a lot of people expected us to do better in the TSL, but full representation this weekend with four of us at MLG and two of us at the GSL World Championships. So just wait. If we all lose <laughs> these things, then there's going to be some problems. But you know how it is. I mean, uh, it's just one tournament. Uh, maybe just some bad luck coincidence that... Five of us got knocked out right away. But we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's definitely heartbreaking. But then it, it's good for me, you know. I'm so full of myself. <laughs> I love myself. And now I'm, like, <laughs> making myself look good. I survived. <laughs> I should make a shirt. Uh, I survived round of 32. It's fine, man. Dude, uh, I, if you win the thing, it's still a win for Team Liquid. Easy. Dude, part, yeah, part of that's me kind of wanted to, to say something like that. Like on the day one of the uh, Korea versus the world, be like, the international team has been chosen through a series of rigorous tournaments and matches from across the globe to get the best eight. The Korea team consists of the top eight ranked players from all five seasons of GSL more commonly known as places 16 to 32 of the Team Liquid Star League. <laughs> oh, but, but I didn't say that publicly. <laughs> Sean, do you want to touch on Rhett Naniwa at all? Or should we move on to day four? Um, I just think Naniwa is like really good. Like really, really good. I mean, I, anytime someone loses, you want to do the, oh, well, there's things he could have done to win. And every yeah. time there's a loss, that statement is true. Um, but, <laughs> like... I was very, very impressed with the way Naniwa made those games look because they they had, like, the right look to them. Like, if someone's dropping you and being crazy aggressive and in your face, generally the, the, the way it's supposed to look is that you're holding on and holding on and trying to stabilize. And right when you stabilize, there's a huge surge forward where the Zerg is going to have a huge amount of difficulty. And the problem is it's very hard to get to that surge forward point unless you're playing very, very calm and very focused. So I was very impressed with Naniwa. I was more I was more excited to see Naniwa's you know improvement <clears throat> less so than um um Red. to just be like oh yeah you know that sucks because I mean in the in the uh, G G G G G C P L G P C L G C P L goes to coaching Premier League yeah, yes yes <laughs> the where um Naniwa and Sen had to spar in a best of five to decide a tiebreaker that was an unbelievable demonstration of, of skill from both players, but I was especially blown away by Naniwa because I hadn't seen hadn't seen his play in quite some time. So um I get I get <coughs> huge props. Also he's left handed. I didn't that's pretty crazy. <laughs> do we, that do is we, so crazy. How do you play <laughs> that game with your know. left hand? One A, two A, three like every left handed player I can't believe. You well, may as well just that. like this I saw I saw Nasdaq play left handed and it just about blew my mind open. <laughs> it looks so weird. It's like 
Okay, set up my keyboard, and now my hands are on the wrong side. What am I doing? Yeah, and they're all close together. It looks like you're playing, like, StarCraft on the Nintendo 64, like, with a controller, because it's all, like, red. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Nazgul stupid. isn't... He isn't left-handed. Yeah, he played left-handed. That's I know, it's because his dad is left-handed, and so that's how his computer at home was set up. Get out of here. <laughs> are you serious? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> what? I'm like the biggest sure. secret of Team Liquid, he just revealed Yeah, that. that's our big secret. <laughs> Nazgul plays left-handed with the mouse on the left side and his right hand on the keyboard, but he is right-handed. I'm that? pretty sure this is the truth of it. <laughs> his that's dad is so left-handed. Weird. Did you see him play baseball? Did you see him like throw with his right hand or something? No, I, or did, I, I think he's trolled. Baseball. Am I trolling uh, you guys? I don't know, man. I don't know. I maybe. <laughs> Tyler <laughs> trolls with a straight face. He's actually the worst breed of troll. He doesn't care about the reaction. <laughs> he just likes he likes yeah. to deliver the content and, and just knows it's out there, and that's good enough for him. <laughs> well, I'm sure that's we true. can read the uh, state of the game thread to figure out more. Uh, Cruncher Idra, do we need to discuss that? We already talked a little bit about. Are you kidding me? Do we need to discuss well, that? Well, we talked about it earlier. The <laughs> antics. JP, do you not smell over. a story when it's like farting in your face? We already covered it, though. Chest? I thought. What What else is there to say, Jeff? Well, not the no. strategy. The actual match, dude. Yeah, oh, game. okay. You're all about the drama. Well, yeah, all about the games. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, would you like to talk about any more of the in-between game chat of the matchup? No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I, I was going to find the, the pictures of those, but I said I'm to. going to be, and I think Greg listens to these, and obviously I'll get back to him. Like, ten people are going to mess with this. And I, I, I struggle with this because I want to talk to Greg because I feel like he is a world-class player who is in a funk. He is not playing to his potential. And the worst part about that is it's not like it's a, a slump. It's not like he's playing awesome and he's just not getting it. I think it's an attitude thing. I think he overlooked this match. I think he publicly overlooked it, but I think he personally is defeated against Protoss 100% all the time. And you can see that in the first game. When he has Cruncher completely contained, he knows exactly the composition he's doing. And he continues to A-move into force fields. Okay, let me, let me describe that statement. Meaning the force fields go up. He can't reach the Protoss army, but he continues to kind of like wash up against it. And then he A-moves his Corruptors. A-moved Corruptors against Void Rays and Colossus are the most uneconomical thing you've ever seen in your life. You have to focus down. You have to corrupt. You probably need investors mixed in there once they start adding as many inf uh, Void Rays as he, do he did. They do so much damage to Void Rays now, by the way. They, I think it's like, isn't it 47 damage in 4 seconds to... It's an area of effect 47 damage to Void Rays and armored units. Um, but he did that time and time again, and even after he kind of thinned out the air units, because his army was idling up against the force fields with 6 Colossus raking damage over them, there was no ground army, so he was dead. But he quit. He mentally quit before that. He's like, oh, he made Void Rays, Colossus, and Force Field. I'll just attack move, and later, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. There is stuff you can do about it. There absolutely are. He just didn't try. I think and his... That frustrates yeah. Me. yeah, I think his execution of what he was doing to kind of put pressure on Cruncher while Cruncher was massing up his, his <coughs> death ball was not the best Idra is, is capable of and not the best he's ever done. And I'm thinking about practice games here, uh, just imagining... Um, but and then and then his execution after once the death ball was complete and Cruncher was ready to go on offense, I think the way Idra handled it was not the best he could do, and I was just like, man, is is this going to be a problem for him in this series, or is he going to come back? I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think strategically um, might be a tough situation against that Colossus Void Ray on Shakuris, but you know, execution is Idra's forte. Right? It's what he does best, and I think he kind of messed it up in that first game. I think the match is is uh, an odd story, too, because I think in the first game, the problems that I just discussed and, and, and Tyler described as well are abundantly clear. But in game two, I think he turned it on and dominated. Oh, yeah. And, and, in, and in game three, I think he... It's a weird thing to say, but I think the same kind of mentality would have carried over, but a good timing from Cruncher stopped Idris short of showing that he was ready to go. 
But that that in and of itself is a problem. Like Idra is a world class player who is above and beyond 99% of the people he plays, but he continuously is getting tricked by people. Like, I, I look to Select or Nazgul in just this past uh, MLG. I mean, Idra went into those matches not as a guy who is like, okay, I really have to be aware of these guys trying to pull Tom Fool around me because I'm the better player. But he went into it as a guy who's like, well, you know, I'll just probably win. And I, I think I'm nitpicking to a certain extent. And, and certainly these things could be going on in his head. I haven't had, like, hour-long conversations with him about it. Um, but as an outsider who has a fairly educated perspective, probably certainly more than anybody else, I guess, I can tell you that Idra's success is not going to skyrocket after this unless um, some serious like mental adjustments are made, I think. And that's that's kind of scary, because I think that's great. That's the worst part of Greg's game. So I kind of want to focus in... <clears throat> I'll throw this to Sean, too. Yes, because he hasn't gotten to talk yet. Wow, it's okay. I've had a nail clipper. I've been rotating. It's <laughs> so fun. So I want to focus in right in on that third game. Um, Cruncher moves out. Let's skip all the mind games that that kicked off the game, even though those are kind of interesting. We're not going to talk about this game for twenty minutes, but Cruncher moves out. I think five lings die. We didn't get to see him die in the vod, but five lings die. We see their corpse. And then there's this huge deal, uh, you know, Idris sees five links die, and then he makes seven drones at once. And then everyone's like, obviously you're going to die. And then Zergs are saying, well, you, you don't know if he's moving out then or not. You have to make a decision as Zerg. Is he actually taking his third and playing defensively? In which case, you have to drone up. Or is he going to do this timing? In which case, you know, you have to build links and roaches and whatnot. And, uh... They're just saying, well, Greg guessed that he was not going to do the timing, so he made drones. And I don't like that, but let's hear Jeff and Sean talk about it. Sean, what do you, you think? Know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to discuss the series in reverse order and begin by saying that I think the one thing that consistently poisons Idris' play is that he plays in reaction mode instead of in action mode. Granted, I think Greg is the... like best reactive player, period. He just considers quite clearly what his opponent is doing, plans, practices, thinks of ways that, okay, if he does this, then he can do these three different um, transitions, so I'll, I'll prepare for these three things. And, and it's always a sort of like, okay, do I have all my bases covered? Okay, and that sort of thing. And that, um, and that ends up being like a big problem when you're dealing with a lot of thin <laughs> situations. Because that definitely was a huge. Oh, did we lose Sean? Uh oh. <laughs> well, it's frozen in a perfect spot, so we'll. Uh... Curse! I had oh. in my early. I'll give you like maybe ten different things he could do. Is my video <laughs> shut down? Yeah, Skype is kind of shutting out on us. We can hear you, but uh, the video is not working. So. <coughs> oh. I think we lost him again. It's especially painful yeah. when day nine's talking because it's like, no, that's a pit that's such good advice. Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess while we're waiting for day nine, one thing I will say though is that like, <coughs> Greg has a higher expectation for winning than than most anyone? players. I almost said anyone. <laughs> yeah. I think it might be anyone. I, um, well, it's probably because he puts it on himself. I would think. Yeah, I mean, he should. He's he's a winner. He's a guy who since Brood War, has considered himself a, a failure unless he wins. And that's a, that's a good attitude to have for a competitor. Yeah. Those all speak for himself. So a, as, uh, as critical as I was, and, and you know, um, maybe he's going to yell at me for this. I don't know. But uh, hopefully not, because I, I, I say it in earnest. Like I, He's one of my best friends. He's like, I spend so much time. I love the guy. He's a great guy. But it's, it's hard watching. Another PBZ that came to mind is like his Nanawa match against uh, Dignitas. I feel like he mentally surrendered before the game was over. And, I, and you know, maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'm way off base. But I guess the point is, the more I want to wrap up with on this real quick, is that uh, he's got a great team around him that's working on this. Like, I definitely am working with him on it. He's working on it. He knows it. He's actually changed up a couple things. I'm not going to give any spoiler on this, obviously. But he is changing his gameplay for MLG um, Dallas, and it's going to be sick, awesome to watch. It's good to hear. Um, and a little bit of what Dan I was talking about, wanting him to be a little bit more proactive about the stuff he's doing, I think we could be in for a treat with that. Wow, I just pasted something in the chat channel for no reason, because <laughs> I'm going crazy. All right, here comes Sean. Am I back? Hey, you're sorry. back. 
God, I hate the new version of Skype. God, I'm going to go back to 3.6 the instant this call ends. Um, <laughs> but, okay, okay, so... A big problem... Okay, so originally a big strength of mine in Brood War is I started to realize that the game was not about trying to correctly guess what my opponent was doing, and it wasn't about needing a lot of information. It was about knowing all the possibilities that could be there and dealing with whatever set of possibilities I was up against. So, for instance, if I saw an opponent early expanding, I knew that there was no wraiths with cloak, or equivalently, no banshees with cloak coming. Um, and so I could deal with that appropriately. And you get a player like Greg, who is amazing at saying something like, yeah, if I can just cut this little thing and put that extra drone there, I'll have a hundred extra gas when no one else will, and I can sneak in an upgrade, which helps me deal with that. And that is and that is a real talent and a real hard thing to, to develop. However, there's a real problem when there's, like, a, a few too many possibilities. And you end up with what I've, I've called for a long time a tweener build, where it's like, oh, it's not, you're not quite putting pressure on your opponent, you're not quite dealing with exactly what he's doing, you're ending, with some, ending up with something that's a little below average against um, everything, which is a really, really awful spot to be in. And so what you kind of need to do is either put a lot of pressure back on your opponent to limit the amount of possibilities that he can do, or you need to really do some sort of extreme powering or some discovery that will let you just be in a completely different situation with a lot more money. Um, which would be something like, if you're finding out that three base play isn't working, try two basing or try four basing. Something like that. Like go heavy econ or heavy um, harassment. So, I mean, game, game three, I'm actually going to kind of just chalk up as like kind of a dumb timing loss. That's the sort of thing that just happens. I don't think that's particularly telling of Idris' style. I saw some drones get plopped down when I was in my head really thinking, Ugh, yeah, I don't, I don't really like the way that that looks. Game two was very much so an action mode game. I'm going to begin getting in your face with drops, and if you open Colossus Void Ray, I'm going to outright just start giving you hell. If he was opening, say, Blink Stalkers, or something like that, then we might see something like a Ret Naniwa style game, where Naniwa has, you know, a lot of blink stalkers, but, you know, Idra would likely be able to manage his economy so well that he would be fine anyways. Thanks to, again, his ability to time his economy, and also by being in action mode. But game one was so reaction-y. It was like, okay, I'm going to get my expansion up, and okay, he's getting that unit, okay, then I'm going to make some of these, and he's getting that unit, okay, I'm going to make some of these. And over time, it was a very standard-looking Max Zerg against a Protoss who's never been under pressure all game long and is Max as well. And it was just too much of a loss. Um, that's, that's my take on it, is that, again, there's a little bit too much reaction-y mindset. I don't know if, that, if anyone agrees with that, but... Um, again, that's... Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I, I like that. That's the feeling I get, too. But I'm always looking like some very specific things. Like I don't like to abandon a build easily. As everyone yeah. knows, I like to refine. So I love to not get too worried about, you know, maybe this build doesn't work, you know, in theory. What very specific little tiny changes can I make to start piecing this together to make sure it works? And like looking at that game three, I don't I and it kinda hits you know, accord with me because Zergs are really whining about this. I'll just say the word. They're whining about it, about these timing attacks and stuff. They're saying it's kind of rock, paper, scissors ish, and it's yeah, kind of like you don't know. And I, I'm yeah. thinking, like, I, I think Idra could have rushed to an Overseer in that game. I don't see why not. He had the lair, and I know he's thinking, yeah. I don't want to throw 100 gas at an Overseer. And and maybe the, yeah, and maybe the overseer will just get sniped before I see anything, but like, n probably not. And you probably that 100 gas will definitely be worth it. Like that's Overlord one thing speed. I'm thinking. Has more yeah, utility. Overlord speed. Yeah, things like that. I'm like, how can you work these things in your builds so that you can get them every single time and you still never die to anything? Like that's yeah. what and what Sean is talking about. Like. When he said, you know, Greg can find an extra 100 gas to get an upgrade, and then I'll have an upgrade when no one else does. Well, the way I like to play so conservatively and be ready for anything is, like, when can I throw a few resources at buying more safety by paying for information? 
maybe I pay 100 gas to have an 80% chance of getting information. How can I make that work for me in, like, a very high percentage of my games? And that's, like, yeah. kind of the thing that I really like to do. Yeah, and I mean, like, that's, that's, that's exactly, like, like kind of what I'm talking about, is, like, taking a proactive approach to it, because I would yeah, argue yeah, yeah. that anytime okay. something's feeling a little too rock, paper, scissories, then, then it means you really need to examine either implementing one of those subtle changes or abandoning your build altogether, because all the rock, paper, scissors yeah. mindset I've been stuck in, I literally had to stop playing for a week and then come back and begin to feel comfortable again, and then I was like, oh, yeah, if I just if I just do this, if I actually just get Overlord speed, even though no one else is really doing it, I can find a style that works really well for me. <laughs> it just um, messages me, tell those fuckers I always rush Ovi speed, it's not in time because their race is broke. <laughs> you could get an Overseer then. Fucking great. Well, you did get an Overseer, I mean... You know, I, I kind of, at the end of the day, there's always going to be like, well, Protoss is broken. There's nothing Azure can do, and and that's actually the crux of the attitude I'm kind of talking about, right? Like, we it we could sit here and theory 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 craft and stumble on these words, um, but the <laughs> bottom line is that there's Zergs that have done very well. Will <laughs> uh, do well, you know. I don't think the game's broken, not just yet. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. like, even I also want to add that even like ignoring Idra's game. Because, again, I kind of thought Game 3 was one of those losses where, like, you'd look at it and be like, oh, yeah, I probably could have just, like, made three more Roches and three more drones there, and I would have held it off. But, I mean, like, in a game that is similar to that, like, doing, like, what you're doing, Tyler, like, maybe I should get an Overseer, and then say, yeah, well, 80% of the time I'm going to find a build where I need to do some massive response. But the other 20% of the time, I'm going to use this Contaminate to beat this small set of the 20% using one of those sort of logic things. Like, oh yeah, if I get Overlord Speed, then maybe I'll spot the set of strategies that I'll be scared against, but against this other set, I'll get Drop. And because I got Speed first, it integrates well with it. Um, little tiny adjustments are just like my favorite thing in the whole wide world. I'm trying to see if Hedro wants to jump on, but I think he might just be in uh, crazy practice mode for MLG, so I don't want to bother him. Uh, but if he wants let's to go on to another could, match. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on to another match. Uh, Koss hey Pro. Anyone? Cost us three orbital commands on two bases. Yes! <laughs> yeah, that love was that. Cool. Yeah. I love that. I've actually been seeing a lot of Terran players do that lately, and you can get so many more units. It's so cool. It's kind of... It, it actually excites me to think that there would be styles of play where you might, like... Again, this is an extreme example, where you'd get, like, four command centers on two bases before really doing very much for just a stupidly powerful brief mid-game, where you'd need to get a third and fourth base really fast, because you'd be broke really quickly, but um, something nuts like that, where there hasn't been enough play with the macro mechanics, even like a Protoss, getting an extra Nexus maybe to just Chrono Boost, because he finds a style that's so cool. So that <laughs> that, re that really gave me a, a, a Terran boner. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, Jeff? Tyler, do you guys have any thoughts on that series? Well, I'll, I'll let Tyler cover it. Uh, <laughs> I think I hit the nail there on the head. No Protoss, yeah. Should we just move on to how Roach counters okay. anything the Toss can make? Well, let, let, let me briefly <laughs> say, oh god, that photo. <laughs> Do you have that? Uh, I could probably find the, the picture yeah, real quick. Yeah, find, find it while I'm blabbing about Costa's Hey Pro, because that's just the funniest thing in the world. Um, it's weird that Hey Pro gets so much crap, by the way. There's this weird, like, internet attitude that he is the, like, I can't win, he's imagine. overrated and stuff. It's so weird. He's actually fantastically, amazingly good. Did anyone yeah. watch the Team Liquid inter-team tournament where he played uh, amazing? <laughs> yeah, where he just yeah. kind of... Where, where, I mean, even up against Liquid Tyler, the best <laughs> player in Liquid. <laughs> well, yeah. There's a lot um, of hate going on. Well, I mean, the one thing that kind of sucks for Hey Pro is that, like, he plays pretty, you know like, traditionally standard Zerg. I mean, lately, you know, all his cool drop and Nidus Worm stuff has been really exciting to watch, but he just doesn't do as much public stuff as possible, so people don't get to see that, and then he doesn't have this, like, you know, yeah. loud personality either, but, I mean, exactly what you said, Jeff, he's he's the fucking man, and he's, like, very funny if you meet him. I had ice cream with him. That's what everyone that. says. He has to be <laughs> the most boring I've guy. I've never heard him talk, life. ever. Like, <laughs> I've never heard him talk. Ever. That's what uh, I'll tell you. What that's what every team liquid guy to a T says that he's hilarious. So I'll take their word on it. But in in my like four meetings with the guy, I've maybe heard <laughs> six words. <laughs> I did. I did want to note briefly about that series is that the in terms of the bracket votes, 
they, they the vote differed by two. Oh yeah, that like, was really cool. As close to fifty fifty as is statistically possible. All right, I've got the it's so like um, ready, Sean. Well, if you want to jump into how Roach counters everything, yeah, I just want to say that you know, Cost won, Haypro could have won. Kind of sucks, but at least Haypro doesn't have to be ashamed because he's hanging out in sixteen to thirty two with some of the best players who've ever graced this game. So happens. Show the photo. Show him, JP. We got it. I, I hope this is. There was many. There was this one. There was the one that was edited, like in game, to where it had the the help menu, and they had like counters, Void Ray Phoenix, or something like that, <laughs> which was pretty good. This Mon Dragon's picture, and that's pretty awesome. Mon Dragon's guide to unit counters. It's got pro taxes, <laughs> Zerg makes Roach. So. I do like the hatchery though. That's funny. The hatchery oh, counters the Phoenix. So, <laughs> so uh, talk to me about that game. I mean, like, what? Absolutely genius. I mean, it's kind of kind of that like reaction versus action mode, where like okay, you see void rays and phoenixes, and you think, oh my gosh, how do I stay alive? How do I not let this do maximum damage? Okay, I'll get some hydralists, and I'll begin getting some queens. I'll begin getting some anti air. But I mean, Mod Dragon's just like, all right, well, how can he not deal with my pressure? It's like, well, a lot of cheap ground units like zerglings and roaches. So I guess I'll just make a shit ton of those. And just, like, wrecked right on in. And that is just the exact Mondragon I knew in Brood War. He was such a pain in the ass to play against. He was pretty much an unknown kind of going into that game, yeah. right? No one really knew what, what he was going to be about or what he was going to be doing. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's entirely yeah. accurate. So after seeing him, I mean, what, what are your opinions on kind of like his uh, gameplay in StarCraft II since this is the first time you've seen it? To whoever I wants mean, to answer that. He has the RTS mind, that's what I say, you know, like doesn't matter that it's a different game than StarCraft, like you learn the tools to be able to think properly, and Mondragon was always a player whose tools were a lot more cerebral, whereas like, you know, a lot of my tools were more like just relying on my hands and my ability to always catch stuff on the minimap and like to be able to macro well, like, man, Mondragon's just like scary good. It's one of those things that when you see that many roaches flooding in, you're kinda like Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? But I'm, like, too busy getting my Hydralisk den and trying to waste should I get a Hydras or the Spire because I still need, I need to stay alive before I can do anything to him. Mondragon brings the boss mode hard, so I think it's going to be a sick, fun series between Mondragon and Cruncher. That's probably one of the top matches I'm looking forward to in the round of 16. Am I casting that? I should look that up. <laughs> Tyler, what are your thoughts on Mondragon and uh, uh, that series as well? Yeah, really impressed by Mondragon. Uh, he's just... Nothing is ruled out for him, I think. You know, kind of like what Sean was saying. You know, most Zergs are just getting ready. They're bracing for the impact of this massive uh, Protoss era army. But Mondragon just knows all of his options. He doesn't rule anything out. And then with a clear head... Uh, he just picks what he thinks w is going to work, and he does it really, really well. And I will say, one of his other strengths, while we're listing um, Hunt Dragon's strengths, his crisis management is ridiculous oh, good. Fucking just, God, it's so obnoxious. If Cruncher tries to, like... <laughs> get Mondragon on his back foot, I'm sorry, bro, that's not going to work. <laughs> Mondragon is going to... Uh, cool as a cucumber. I can't even say it. Or, like, <laughs> cucumber. See, I can't even manage the crisis of saying cool as a cucumber while talking about <laughs> Mondragon being amazing. He's as creep as a cool fucker, man. <laughs> 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 Welcome back, Jeff. Welcome back. Thank you. We're talking about Mondragon Xerax and uh, yep. Tyler's screwing up things. <laughs> what are your thoughts <laughs> on Mondragon, man? I'm happy. Um, <laughs> the guy is kind of a dark horse. Like nobody, yeah. a lot of people are like, does he even play? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you yeah. Beat him. Uh, were you? I mean, Tyler and Sean were just saying that they were pretty much expecting that to. to or expecting Mondragon just to be what to play exactly how he played. I'm stumbling through words now. Uh, what were you at all impressed, or are you just expecting that as well from Mondragon? Um, I didn't know what to expect, so I didn't really have any expectations going in. Um, I was surprised he won. A lot of people like I don't know Xerix very well at all, but everyone's like, "Oh, he's great. He's gonna win for sure." Um, but he didn't. 
You guys spanked pretty good. <laughs> that should uh, should wrap that up. <laughs> Not a TLO. Um, Tyler, you want to start this out? Uh, I won't give a full analysis, but I'll say I I really like the way TLO was playing. Um, I thought his mechanics looked pretty good, and he came in to the match with some good game plans, like I think we were all expecting him to do. And we were kind of sad when it wasn't enough for him to take the best of three, but damn, game two. That was fucking yeah. pretty cool. I was really bummed about the early expand against Nada on Terminus. Or, um, no, yeah, Terminus. Um, I've, I've, I, the, the instant I saw Thorazane do that against um, what's a Fruit Dealer, I tried to do that against the Terran. I just like got smashed by the exact same thing that... Um, wh- why are the names escaping me? I, uh, I got smashed in the exact same way that Nada smashed um, TLO. Just like the Cloak Banshee's so hard to deal with with that spread out in this, so I was kind of a little bit frowny. Jeff, did you uh, have any thoughts on that game? On not I missed it. I had to be on the road, unfortunately. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one series I haven't actually caught yet either, so I don't know what questions to ask you guys about it. <laughs> um, so Nada and Nada's going to be playing who in the round of 16? Has that been decided? I guess it has been decided, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Looks like you guys are thinking, so maybe you'll have an answer soon. Huh? <laughs> 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 Nothing. Nothing. I guess I guess that wraps up the TSL three. I think he's playing Koss, isn't he? What well, what was the question? I'm not gonna lie, I was actually uh, Round of sixteen, who does not a play? Um he plays Empire Koss, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. I should be pretty How do you like Koss's method. chances? I don't know anything about his T V T. I hope it's within two. <laughs> well <laughs> talk about NASL. Um, but we're not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, we'll probably go into uh, in-depth once they get to the round of 16. But all the players are known. I don't have a list handy. Hopefully you guys have a, a player in mind that you were um, surprised to be chosen for the NASL, is how we'll phrase that. So, Tyler, who is the one player uh, out of the 50 that were chosen that kind of surprised you? Um... I I gotta say I'm kind of surprised, but not unpleasantly surprised, but just surprised that Artosis and Grubby actually made it in. <laughs> I wasn't sure that they were gonna make it in, but uh, I'm very excited to see them play in the NASL. I think what's really great there's there's some drawbacks for sure to uh, this format um, divisional play. But a huge pro is that we're gonna get like a really in-depth look at every single one of these 50 players. Like you're gonna have a lot of matches to judge them by. All three matchups, multiple instances of each matchup. So if you're wondering how good Grubby is right now, we are soon gonna know, and not just from MLG, which you know could be a fluke or could be the best turn of his of his StarCraft two career. We don't know. Yeah. But NASL group play, I think, is gonna be very revealing, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Jeff, who was the uh, the most surprising hmm. player to see on the list? Um, well, there was a couple interesting ones, like a uh, vibe. I think is an interesting one. Um, I, I consider him like a super dark horse. Like he has not made big appearances or in tournaments. He's not yeah. a big personality. He does not have um, a huge following or any kind of big major contribution. But he's a guy who a lot of people know um, and, and say, well, you know, he's really freaking fast. He plays kind of a different offbeat uh, style of Zerg, and he's got the potential to do really well. So I was pretty surprised to see him. But, uh, you know, I, I think he could do well. Moman, another guy. Yeah, I haven't, he, he, like, I haven't almost seen, made it yeah. entirely off his video. Like, everyone is so in love with that video. So <laughs> I haven't cool. seen that. What was, his, what was his video, if you can give a quick description? Just making fun of his French accent, basically. Ah, okay. Sounds pretty good. Sean? Yeah, I mean, I think, what, like, I don't think anyone is, like, shocking, you know? It's not like, oh, my God, I love him. And, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's one of those tournaments that has, like, uh, kind of a funky mix, I would say, in terms of, like, skill levels. I would say that anyone who's, like, really involved in the StarCraft community is going to recognize every single one of these names. Um, yeah. But... 
if someone were to say, we need 50 players for a tournament and make them good, you're going to end up with a lot of, like, mostly Korean, I would say. You know, there'd probably be, like, 20 to 25 of the 50 in Korean. Um, but then, in this tournament, I mean, you have, like, Moon and Xenio and July, and then also, like, Cats and Dark Force and Mo Man. Like, well, actually, I don't want to include Dark Force, because I, really, I think Dark Force is actually, like, really, really good. But Cats and Mo Man, who, again, are, like, named Zers, who are good but have not competed at the same level as Moon and Xenio in July. So that, to me, is the really interesting um, aspect of this tournament, is that taking that and combining it with, just as was already said, their 10-person groups, so you get the chance to really see everyone kind of churn their strategies out. And everyone has an opportunity to take a game with, you know, that many people in their group. I'd be surprised if anybody in the tournament went 0-9. Um, but that's that's the most exciting to me, really, is to see those brackets pan out. I'm trying to look at some of the names. I mean, I guess Boxer's in there for obvious reasons, but I figured he was going to kind of remove himself from playing after watching the Team League, but maybe not. Uh, Jeff, when do those uh, matches actually start? Second week of April. Um, the Monday. So whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So tune into that, guys. Uh, who, yourself, and Greetorp will be casting the opening matches, right? Yep. We opening cast will be me, and Greetorp. Cool. Super excited. Big, awesome studio. Fun stuff. It's gonna be amazing. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. Time to move on to the user questions, as it is getting kind of late, and I gotta get on a flight and haven't packed yet. So, <laughs> uh, user questions you can send them into SOTG questions at gmail dot com, or you can send them into our Google Voice hotline at two zero nine seven five two SOTG. No voice questions this week because my laptop is still somewhat dead. Uh, but from Dan, and not the uh, artosis that we all know and love, uh, he says, as the financial stakes in Western esports continue to rise, how do the players foresee balancing your interests with those of your team and sponsors? Throw this to Tyler first. Skip. What? What was the question? <laughs> yeah, I heard it, um, and it kind of like ended suddenly. At as yeah. the financial stakes in Western esports continue to rise, how do the players foresee okay. balancing your interest with those of your team and your sponsors? And he, he goes on. He says, for instance, I can imagine the like teams streaming? Would, would push would push for tournament entries, and sponsors would favor publicity heavy events, while the players need more training and rest to compare to what the teams and sponsors would prefer. Huh. Can we shed some lights. Shed some light on these dynamics. Thanks. Well, I'm going to step in and just say that what's really nice is that whenever there becomes that much overcrowding of tournaments, um, it's an amazing chance for really tournaments to exist, really big tournaments to exist alongside smaller and medium-ish size. So, for instance, if you're the best player on Team Liquid, someone as such as Liquid Tyler, you can you can just enter those major tournaments with the big prize pools and really focus on those and get the publicity, not just for your sponsors, but also the rest that you need as a player. But if you are someone who's up and coming and really wants to try to prove yourself, you have all these smaller tournaments where you can really prove yourself, and then you can approach one of these bigger tournaments that might be invite or that might be open and go into them saying, yeah, I have a little bit of experience under my belt. Um, so I, I think it creates a nice ladder where the... Um, super top pros can sustain themselves and get that rest, kind of like what happened in in, um, in Korea with a lot of those top pros, but that also allow for the newer players. Bam. Tyler, Jeff, you guys have any thoughts? Um, it's an interesting question. I think uh, part of what he's asking is like like conventions or like PAXs um, is he asking, like, if there's ever a situation where you have to kind of choose between the two? I think that's kind of what he's getting at. Where where do you draw the line in terms of a player wanting to go to something that interests them and a, uh, their team or sponsor wanting them to go to a different tournament? Well, unfortunately, I can only... Uh, I mean, fortunately, actually, I can only speak to my experience with EG, Evil Geniuses, and it's pretty awesome. I think I get to... I get to do... They're really player-centric, so... The tournaments are the most important, but then where we can fit in between, I'm able to do things like a PAX East, or um, soon I'm going to be doing this this uh, press like 
I'm going to be speaking to boards of people about StarCraft and the professionalism of it, which is kind of cool. So there's like opportunities like that in between. Um, it's, it, it's pretty hypothetical, I think, and it's in the future, if it ever does happen, where a player has to choose between a tournament and this really important PR event. So I don't know where to draw the line. I don't have an answer on that, unfortunately. All right. Well, okay. next question from Cock Horse. No anal analytical thinking here. What did everyone eat for breakfast yesterday? <laughs> Protein shake. Tyler? Uh, just a fiber bar. Jeff? Strawberries and cream from um, Starbucks. Uh, frappuccino. Pretty good. I didn't wake up till 5 yesterday, so breakfast was actually dinner. Uh, <laughs> <but> <laughs> the last question from uh, Confused Crib. Uh, what do you guys think makes certain players just appear so strong for certain periods of time. Each season, the GSL winner has looked relatively untouchable, and even now, Lucier is looking like a beastly Zerg just stomping his opponents. How do you explain why a certain player just seems to dominate the scene in chunks of time, while others are just consistently strong, but never really look unbeatable? You would think uh, Jinro and Marine King would be good examples for this. Tyler, you haven't answered a question yet besides the last one, so this is on you. It's like it's like uh, the big Lebowski when the narrative <laughs> he's trying to describe the dude and he's like you know there's a man for his time you know he's he's the man you know what I'm saying so like I think what it is is a player figures out kind of what's going on right now and they figure out exactly how to beat it and then they just go on like a killing spree and win all these tournaments and it. It really is kind of unbeatable for that time. They haven't constructed this like un, you know, unbeatable build that they're putting into practice, but they have had like a stroke of genius that they've actually been able to infuse into their gameplay and put it to work. Uh, so that's why I think people will really, really dominate <coughs> for a period of time, and then it'll just kind of go away, uh, and then other. Most most good people are they can't really rely on something like that. If you're going to be a pro gamer, a consistent pro gamer, you can't rely on that kind of uh, playing to uh, you know be your day to day what what gets you by all the time. So most people, you're not going to see that. It's just going to be one or two guys at a time that are doing something like that. I think that answers the question pretty well, Sean Jeff. Well, you want to winning is pretty contagious on both sides. Like, when a guy is winning and feeling confident, he executes at a higher level. But also, when when that like snowball starts rolling, people who have to face him have mental barriers that previously they typically don't have. Of course, like by winning, he's yeah. winning here and he's winning there. Speaks to like generalities, obviously, but I think that's part of what goes on too. Momentum. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to say that there's a lot of players who get that, like, real fire in their heart. By the way, I got the joke, Tyler. You know. <laughs> uh, I got to keep the straight face for long enough. <laughs> I know, I saw that smile just, just like, <laughs> uh, like um, a lot of players get that fire in them. Like, that's what I think a lot of champions get made of, is that they're, they're really good players, and then they, one day, they later on say, you know what, I'm going to kill this player who's better than I am in this round of 32, and they work really hard, and they crush them, and they get the, yeah, yeah, let's do this, let's go into the next round, and they do that, and you can only do that for so long, because it's really, really, really exhausting to have that, like, absolute passionate fire driving your motivation for a lot of practice. It's not the case for all the players, but I have seen many players like that, who just get real amped up, and, and then go a little bit out of control. The fucking um, killer eye that Jadong has, God, that scared oh. me. Jesus, that frightens me, man. When he just gets angry, he's like, fuck everyone. I'm going to win this. Oh, my God. It's scary. <laughs> well, that's going to do it. Real quick, before we wrap up, you guys might have uh, heard that the SC Reddit opens no longer exist because they're moving on to bigger and better things. And uh, there was a teaser for uh, something that they're going to be doing in the future, and the torch has been passed to us to do the next tease. So this is it. Uh, you can go and type in the answer. Oh, God, what is the website as I scramble? Okay, go to goodluckhavefun.org. <laughs> You're the ultimate typer. I am, but I'm also insanely tired. So 
Go to goodlookhavefun.org, type in the answer to this question, and uh, some more pieces of the puzzle will be revealed. What was the date that the current panel was formally introduced on State of the Game? That was beautiful. Thank you. What the fuck is that sound? Do you know, make out? <laughs> <laughs> so my chair kind of needs to be oil. <laughs> Mine's not that loud. It's still fairly new. So I can't do that. I'm very sad for this. Chef types on a keyboard. He needs that <laughs> head cut off. D9 has nails on a chalkboard. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's very true, Jeff. It's very true. The world is not fair. Follow us on Justin TV. Click the follow button below. It really helps us out. You can follow... State of the Game on Twitter at twitter.com slash state of the game. You can follow myself on Twitter at twitter.com slash jp. Review us on iTunes. That helps as well. Uh, obviously, myself and Wheat will be at MLG Dallas this uh, weekend casting. And uh, you can see everyone else here as well. <laughs> and uh, also, the weekend after that, I'll be casting the Intercollegiate Electronic Sports Event. That is a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> 24 universities across the country they are going to be battling out to see who is the first crown champion of collegiate StarCraft II teams. That's sponsored by NOS Energy Drink and Major League Gaming. I'll be in Indianapolis for that event. Please, please check that out. And uh, that's all I got. Tyler, where can people find out about you? Well, first I want to thank my sponsor for the great Team Liquid team, uh, The Little App Factory. Go to thelittleappfactory.com. Uh... And everyone can check me out at MLG this weekend. I will be there. Come say hi as long as I haven't just lost or I'm not a, just about to oh. play. I'd love to meet you. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. That's Tyler Washleski, T Y L E R W A S I E L E S K I. Uh, no, I have not changed what? it yet. What? <laughs> you just spelled your last name like it was nothing. C Y L E R W A S C H E G H I E S C K C I. Tyler, we talked yeah. about this. Did you? I haven't changed. I haven't decided. I'm going to change it to something easier. I haven't done it yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, change it to Tyler. That's that's, oh, that's pretty common, man. Liquid Tyler. It's already it's taken, taken by it someone. Well. Liquid Tyler one. I can do this all day, guys. <laughs> yeah, I might just have to add a number, um, but we'll see. Uh, that's good enough for me. All right. Sean? Twitter.com slash Day9TV. And most importantly, Day9TV.blip.tv. Or even Day9.TV. Or YouTube.com slash Day9TV. It is so fun to plug myself because it's pretty much the same thing again and again. That's true. Um, and I'm going to be at MLG this weekend, so say hi. That's it. <coughs> all you, Jeff. So... Um, did you just hit your webcam <laughs> with that pin? I did. That was great. <laughs> right by it. Bam, bam. Oh, the man, the myth, the legend. Day nine. Please, please, please meet all of us at MLG Dallas. I am so excited for that tournament. It's going to be so awesome. Every too. time we go to an event, we meet more people that listen to the show. Are we going to do a uh, state of the game, by the way, in a hotel room? Are we doing that, Joe? Ob, ob we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll like bring all the equipment. I might bring the webcam, so maybe we could stream it or something. Yeah. We'll um, I do have a webcam, so that's good news for everybody. I will be using it. Could not tonight. Um, and that's okay, but there will be a webcam. You guys will get to see my big floppy mug. And actually, any time I'm in front of a mirror or a webcam, all I do is make faces into it the whole time. Like the face Tyler's <laughs> making right now, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm always making a face. It's actually ridiculous. So I'm going to get more hate because I'm going to be like an attention whore and stuff. It'll be apparently what everyone wants, so that's fine. Um, please do follow me on hate. Twitter, 88 in control. Please add me there. Um, like to tweet, all that good stuff. And then subscribe on YouTube, in control TV, and then follow me on Justin TV at in control TV there as well. And then uh, a lot of people have been asking this, but the NASL will kick start in the second week of April. That is Monday, the second Monday. We're, we had to delay it a week, um, so we're not stepping on MLG toes. And also we we're preparing ourselves, getting all ready. That information should all be going up pretty, uh, pretty soon. Or Russ will kill me because I'm making announcements or something like that. I don't know. I think that's the 11th. Um, but I'm super excited for that. You know, there's uh, haters going to hate, but, but the big, big end, the, ugh, the big story here is that you know what. Another awesome league, another opportunity for some great players to play, 
And I get to cast, and I love casting, and I get to play. I love playing. It sounds like a little playground for me, and I, I can't wait to do it. So <laughs> hopefully you guys have fun checking it out, and uh, I think it'll be a fun journey. Yeah, I think for everyone that's attended or, or watched an MLG last year, it should be amplified, hopefully, from what I've been told. <laughs> I'll figure this out tomorrow when I arrive, but it should be ten times better than it was last year. So there's no more bleachers. I'm sad we don't get our song, though. They're like, we'll do that for Columbus. No. Oh, the, the intro song? Yeah. So yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll have it for Columbus. I, I was going to come out in like a hockey mask, and I was going <laughs> to rip something to the audience and tear my shirt off. And I am going to replay the Reddit thing uh, so people can go <laughs> check this out if it actually wants to replay it. <laughs> what was the date that the current panel was... Either way, I'm going to get my heart. ...on State of the Game? Wave. Oh, I hate that picture so bad. It's actually such a bad picture of everyone but Tyler. Yeah, so you yeah. can go type in the answer to good luck, have fun dot oh god, is it org or com? Dot org. <laughs> there you go. So oh go type god. in your answer. Jeff, I haven't slept that much. Just keep, just right. we'll see you guys next week. Uh, I'll probably do a show Tuesday. And uh, MLG this weekend, it's going to be awesome. GSL starting in three hours from now, round of 16. Those four matches will be kicking off. It's going to be awesome as well. See you guys later. Thanks to our special guest, Sean, for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, congrats to Sean for finishing his thesis, That's guys. true. Everyone give him so a... Oh, wait, wait, okay, wait, hold on. I've finished the writing portion. I need to do the final paperwork for the school where I, like, turn in forms and, like, take my blood and I have to, like, you know, cut off limbs and shit. But once, once I'm in MLG, I'll be officially, completely, and totally done with, like, half of what I need to be. Well, I, just, um, I just realized yeah. the answer to that question is my birthday. That's actually... Uh, Sean? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, like, looked over and blinked out. I was like, why is there a paste in my birthday? Thank you, Jeff. No, seriously, it is, like, the biggest yeah. burden lifted from my shoulders to, like, not have to worry about that anymore. Just as a reminder to people, Day9 goes full-time with eSports when he's done with that damn thesis, so everyone uh -oh. should be on their feet with excitement. That's actually going to be such a, an ascension of eSports. And dare I say ascension, Tyler? Dare I use yeah. that word? Just use it, man. It's, I'm getting it's been so long, it's free for anyone. We're going to have our posts as <laughs> readily accessible to NASL. I feel like we have to have the conversation with them now. <laughs> All right. Time to go. Sean, you back. I, forgot I, can just, I can just join back into the call like Battlement 2.0. That, that's the end of the show. We're going to cue to the bad picture of 6 Chen JP, a very pissed off Jeff, a sock My puppet, God. Day 9, and the most normal looking Tyler to ever grace. The pissed off bull dyke in control. <laughs> <laughs> Got a patch. See you guys later. We are out. Peace. Tyler's drunk. <laughs>